Yeah, good evening, guys. So please type in the chat box. Is the audio and video fine? Good evening, all of you. So welcome back to this session, XEB today. So basically, we have finished the maths in the last two lectures. So XEA का महायोजन हुआ था. So this session पे मैंने XEB fluid mechanics का महायोजन करता हूँ. So एक बार confirm कीजिए. Audio and video दोनों fine है या नहीं? Fine. Good. Okay. So we will start this session. So as you know, we have covered this fluid mechanics plenty of times in uh, fast track and then after in Mahayujans of mechanical. Okay. So we have done this in many places. Okay. So in today's session, the focus will be majority on only on this extra topics. Okay. So normally in, in this session, we are going to stress on those topics which were there in both mechanical and XC. But in mechanical, we don't stress so much because of very uh, less number of questions. But now in XC, there are plenty of questions which come from every topic because you know from a single subject you have 22 questions. So it's not like you can leave some topics and all. Okay, so you have to uh, you know get in touch with each and every detail of every concept. So we will actually focus on non-Newtonian fluids first because you know sometimes people don't put enough attention on this non-Newtonian fluids because in mechanical the kind of questions comes are very uh, you know less actually. Okay, so that's why we'll put the first point on non-Newtonian fluids. Then we'll go to the RTT Reynolds transport theorem. So especially the in Reynolds transport theorem. Special understanding will be on applying it for linear momentum and angular momentum uh, cases. Okay, so linear momentum and also angular momentum cases. Then exact solutions of Navier-Stokes equation. Like again, you see in few places you might not have seen Navier-Stokes equation. It generally, in mechanical people derive the flow through pipes and all using uh, you know some basic shear stress balance and all. But anyway, we'll look at this Navier-Stokes equation. Of course, we don't derive the velocity profiles, but we will see some nice important points about exact solution like for some simple flows you can actually solve navier stokes equations okay like coit flow plain poiseley Huygen poiseley flows okay and uh, you can see thin film flows we'll discuss about these four flows okay because they are in syllabus actually so we will discuss about them and also we will complete this potential flows so basically this potential flows we will deal in complex numbers okay because only the word is complex but actually if you know complex numbers potential flows will become very easy for you okay like based on only one single operation you will be able to calculate steam functions velocity potential functions whatever you want using a simple technique one single technique will actually give you every detail about the types of flows actually clear so these are the topics that we are going to cover in this particular session okay so is that clear to all of you are you all okay with the plan that we are going to take in this session so firstly we will look at non newtonian fluids then in all transport theorems and then we will also talk about navier stokes equations and here we will talk about the potential flow okay yeah, extra topics of FM and also this uh, like few special topics where understandings are not very uh, clear. Okay, because again, if I was start from you know what is definition of viscosity and if I start going, then this session will be uh, you know never ending session. But uh, anyhow, we have done all those things in Mahayana of mechanical and also in uh, fast track actually. Myself, I have taken the fast track course this year, so you have already uh, enough touch in with that. So we'll just go with these two these things. Okay, so chalo, let's start the first topic: non-Newtonian fluids. Actually, okay, so you know. Basically, in case of Newtonian fluids, in case of Newtonian fluids, your tau is equal to mu into d gamma by dt, of course. Okay, so this is shear strain weight, of course. Okay, and mu is the dynamic viscosity, and of course, we'll see for some low velocity profiles, for linear velocity profiles, for linear velocity profiles, or basically thin gaps. Let's say for linear velocity profiles, or of course, thin gaps. In thin gap, you know, even if there is a curvature, you can fit it with a straight line. Your tau is equal to mu into du by dy, the velocity gradient, or whether I would say normal in kinematics and all if there is flow. So dou u by dou y actually in for Newtonian fluids. Okay, but when you come to the non-Newtonian fluids, there are only some very limited number of fluids which obey this Newton's law of viscosity. So we'll discuss about those fluids which do not have obey this property. Okay, so this is Newton's law, of course, Newton's law of viscosity. Newton's law of viscosity. Okay, now let's see. In case of non-Newtonian fluids, non-Newtonian fluids actually. So if you look at this non-Newtonian fluids, then the e we have plenty of models which models the shear stress and the shear strain weight of the fluids. Actually, one very important good model is Oswald D. Wallis model. Okay, so we will have a clear idea on what is this Oswald Wallis model because this model actually fits with many of the results okay so that's why we take this model now let's see here the shear stress and the shear strain rate are connected by T naught plus some constant a into du by dy whole power 
n of course okay so this uh, this is the equation and this equation is actually a special case of this like for example you see you compare these two equations in this equation if you put tau naught is equal to 0 a is equal to constant mu n is equal to 1 then you will end up with that equation okay so here you can see this tau naught is actually called yield shear stress yield shear stress or it's sometimes it's also called threshold shear stress and this is called flow consistency index flow consistency index and this n is called flow behavior index actually okay so this is flow behavior index clear so this is called the flow behavior index of course okay now why n is called the flow behavior index the nature how fluid behaves depends actually on that n of course okay so let's see how we identify the things if if a is equal to mu tau naught is equal to 0 and n is equal to 1 then fluid is newtonian fluid of course okay fluid is newtonian fluid newtonian fluid actually okay so fluid is actually newtonian fluid now we know by the definition of fluid when you apply even infinitesimally shear stress infinitesimally small shear stress fluid immediately starts moving okay because fluids cannot resist shear stress okay so except one certain special cl uh, class of fluids which are called the viscoelastic fluids apart from this viscoelastic fluids rest all fluids even if you apply some small amount of shear stress immediately the fluid starts deforming okay so initially we consider the case where fluids do not have yield shear stress what is yield like for example you see let's say for example you take your toothpaste okay as soon as you tilt your toothpaste you know your toothpaste won't start flowing out okay because it needs certain shear stress has to be applied on the material then it starts deforming okay so such type of fluids are called viscoelastic fluids okay but in general you take water kerosene or any fluid in general in day to day life majority of the fluids they don't have any uh, you don't need any yield shear stress to begin the flow okay you just produce some small amount of infinitesimal shear stress fluids immediately start flowing okay so we will discuss about the case of tau naught is equal to zero tau naught is equal to zero actually okay so because this is obeyed by majority of the fluids now what we understand is look tau is equal to some constant a into du by dy whole power n of course and this can be written as tau is equal to a into magnitude of du by dy whole power n minus 1 into du by dy is what you have here okay now you can understand one thing this is of the form like for example if i call this term eta okay if i call this term eta this eta is called apparent viscosity of the fluid because the more familiar model to deal with fluids is this and here you can see if you can take this term as some particular variable eta let's say this eta is called apparent viscosity of course eta is called apparent viscosity apparent viscosity so this eta depends it depends basically on the type of the fluid and here you can see this eta in turn also depends on this n of course a is just a factor which is multiplied to this term but this n actually decides the value of this and the nature of the fluid actually okay now let's let me ask you a few questions here let's take a graph for example okay so if i take a graph on which i am plotting shear stress and also the shear strain rate tau and also du by dy for example if i am plotting then you know the newtonian fluid is straight away passes through horizon so this is basically the newtonian fluid okay so newtonian fluid so this is basically your newtonian fluid now i want to ask you one thing see in this case as n increases it, let's say if n is greater than 1 for example okay case 1 if n is greater than 1 of course okay if n is greater than 1 then can you tell me as du by dy increases as du by dy increases what happens to eta can anyone tell me whether eta will increase or decrease look n is greater than 1 which means this power n minus 1 is positive okay so this implies n minus 1 is actually positive if n minus 1 is positive then if you are increasing this velocity gradient then what happens to this this apparent viscosity this apparent viscosity will increase or decrease type in the chat box what do you feel will happen to this apparent viscosity if this n is positive if n is greater than 1 or if n minus 1 is positive if you are increasing this term what happens to this total term it increases or decreases increases right it actually 
in case correct because if you see for example if i have power 0.5 for example okay if i put 3 power 0.5 and 4 power 0.5 clearly this value is as this base is increasing then this value keeps increasing correct so this increases so fluids actually behave in such a way if you are trying to deform them faster and faster it you you feel it more difficult to move them okay because this apparent viscosity increases like for example let's say here you have a fluid like this okay now let's say here you up to this level you keep your hand and if you try to deform it slowly you feel it easy to deform the fluid but if you try to deform it fast then definitely you'll feel very high resistance for your hand actually okay so you can understand one thing this slope if you take for example this apparent viscosity as the slope as this du by dy is increasing this n is constant and this term is positive so this slope value keeps increasing so the fluid if it starts from here the slope actually increases the slope actually increases as you increase your du by dy like for example if you draw two tangents here okay so if you draw a tangent here and as you increase your du by dy you can understand the inclination of the tangent increases and finally the slope increases actually clear so the slope value keeps increasing in this case so this set of fluids are called shear thickening fluids shear thickening fluids actually okay and here you can see i have actually given you some examples also which is taken from one of the standard textbooks again so here you can see the case of shear thickening fluids like for example you might have seen suspension of sand in water which is one of the common experiences for you in beach and all if you just try to move the sand slowly you can move it easily okay let's suppose you're constructing some structures and all with sand so when you are trying to move the wet sand then you can move it very easily of course okay but when you are trying to push it very hard okay then definitely you'll feel a lot of resistance which you generally see in this case okay similarly this butter rice starch all these things so anyway so this class of fluids are basically called shear thickening fluids or they are also called dilatant fluids dilatant fluids and here n value is more than one okay see the main thing is it's not like mugging up this line this curve lies below this line or above this line nothing in some books you, can, you will even find the curves will be like this okay and you will see the curves are like this actually in that case okay so it doesn't matter like it's below or above depending on the type of fluid its viscosity values are low this curve will be bottom but the main thing is as you increase your du by dy the slope of the curve should increase okay this is for n greater than one actually similarly when n is less than one then obviously you can understand the slope should decrease as you move forward so the slope turns out turns out like this so these are called pseudoplastics or shear thinning fluids okay so these are called shear thinning fluids actually in this case okay so whenever the fluid if you are trying to disturb it fast and fast you will feel it more easy like for example you see i would like to uh, say one simple example for you like many of you might have seen this latex paint okay if you see this latex paint when they are applying to the walls and all okay you can observe the person who is trying to apply will not move it slowly actually fight to spread diesel the person wraps it very fast okay because if the layers are moving very fast then the viscosity decreases and it becomes easy for the painter to actually paint to the wall have you seen you see normally ex except when they are painting some small paintings and all normally if i want to paint a wall they'll actually roll the scrubber very fast have you seen this because this latex paints come under the pseudo plastic fluids and when you try to deform them fast the apparent viscosity decreases and it is easier for you to apply the paint clear have you seen all these examples in day to day life okay so let's get back to this uh, things okay then idm bingham plastic so viscoelastic fluids won't start deformation matlab until you apply certain stress until you apply certain amount of stress this fluids will not start deforming means you cannot see any deviation or any movement of the flow once it reaches some threshold value then it actually turns out see similarly depending on type of fluid it can be like you know uh, shear thickening or shear thinning anything but this is the case of one special case which is bingham plastic bingham plastic actually here okay so this is bingham plastic and here this tau naught is not equal to zero in this case your tau naught is not equal to zero like your toothpaste and all i have told you and here n is equal to one n less than one 
okay and tau not is equal to zero in all these cases because the deformation starts immediately as soon as you apply some small amount of shear stress you can see correspondingly there are certain values of du by dy okay so this is how the curves are plotted actually in the l cases okay you need not mug up that this curve lies above this curve lies below all these things because in gate examination few times they ask you questions based on the values of n actually okay based on this simple concept of apparent viscosity is this clear to all of you yes So please type in the chat box. Is this clear to all of you? Did you understand this? Okay. And I would like to give you one more thing. Actually, there are some time varying fluids. Okay. So time thickening or time thinning fluids. Actually, time thickening or time thinning fluids. Time thinning fluids. Like for example, you take eta apparent viscosity with the time. In this case, apparent viscosity with time actually here. Okay, so apparent viscosity with time, eta here and time here. Then let's say initially at time t equal to zero, it has got some viscosity. Then, in few cases, as time increases, this eta value keeps increasing. In few cases, it actually can decrease actually. Okay, so if eta is increasing with time, then we call them time thickening fluids. time thickening fluids like for example you take this case in case of time thickening fluids like gypsum in water like for example you make cement with water okay you mix cement with water and if you just leave that as time increases the layers of the cement are mixed with water becomes hard and hard and finally they cannot move actually okay similarly here maybe uh, nail polish also shows some similar phenomena because you can see actually in your home let's say for example your mom or sister is having some nail polish then if you just keep that nail polish like that for a long time okay let's say for example for one month you don't disturb it and you keep there when you open you'll see there is some solidified you know structures which gets formed okay on the nail polish bottle you might have seen means inside okay so inside you can see there's some layers which are formed which are solidified actually okay so which means the fluid which is inside gets solidified and the apparent viscosity obviously increases okay so these fluids are also called you can see here aeophectic fluids You have hectic fluids, and these are called time thinning, where with increase in time, your apparent viscosity decreases. So, time thinning fluids, time thinning fluids, and these are also called as normally thick isotopic fluids. Okay, thick isotopic fluids actually, and you can see a lot of examples like painter ink, lipstick. These are the general examples which uh, we generally come under. the thick isotopic uh, category of fluids actually okay so if someone give you some type of fluid by defining the value of n minus 1 okay so meant sometimes people actually do mistakes here look they'll give you this value okay they'll give you this term if eta of a substance is defined as some constant maybe 2 into du by dy whole power 0.3 they'll give you this okay and many times people feel this value is n value okay but actually you can see apparent viscosity has this n minus 1 here okay so this value which is given is actually n minus 1 value so n is of course 1.3 okay so this is greater than 1 clear so just by looking at this value don't decide this is the n value because in apparent viscosity we have n minus 1 term here clear to all of you so this is a brief discussion on non newtonian fluids clear yes is this clear to all of you did you all understand how we decide the type of fluid depending on the value of n okay every of every one of you so please type in the chat box is this discussion clear till this point i think even last year one question has come up okay in 2023 fine so let's go to the next topic which is of course uh, this are the examples then let us go to the renolds transport theorem actually okay so what does a renolds transport theorem tells you in in general okay so if you have a control volume for example if you have a control volume so this is some control volume and let's say into this control volume some fluid is going and something is coming out actually so okay so let's say there is a fluid flow for example then system is basically fixed by some set of particles let's say if this is the system actually at time t what means the mass which is inside the control volume at time t is basically the uh, system okay now what happens when this flow happens system will be thrown out of the control volume as yes or no like for example 
if i want to analyze a tank okay at time t equal to 0 what is the mass inside the tank what are the particles inside the tank i am treating that as my system now at t equal to 2 seconds or maybe 3 seconds then the system inside the tank won't remain same okay it, it means of course the system remains same but the system won't stay inside the tank okay the system will actually flow out some part of the system will move out so because of this flowing out because of the moving of the system there is some property which changes in the system let's say for example till t equal to 0 the system is sta static in a tank okay now when this system starts moving then definitely the system the particles has got certain momentum change okay so like that depending on the type of system the fluid which is inside or basically the system what we consider will undergo certain change in properties okay and because this system is leaving the control volume the properties of the control volume will also change yes or no can you correlate these two things guys try to understand let's say till that point if the system is stationary for example just the easiest case i am talking okay if the system is stationary then the system has zero momentum now let's say because of some effect this fluid started flowing out when this fluid started flowing out the system's momentum actually changes okay so when the system momentum changes the properties of the system is changing because the momentum is changing actually similarly when the system is flowing out of the tank the energy of the tank or maybe some uh, you know if you talk about temperature of the tank something some property of the control volume that control volume properties will also change okay so in all transport term actually connects these two things okay how a property of a system change is connected to the property change of a control volume is done by the Reynolds transport term actually clear so basically if you see if v is any system or b is any property if v is any property if v is any property actually here then rtt of course i am not doing the derivation here because i generally do it in the uh, you know in long and uh, of course if there is some derivation i will show you here so you can see yeah control volume analysis uh, so maybe second part here i would like to show you here so yeah this is recently one of the batches to whom i taught okay i think i have already derived rtt by the time i got here so maybe here yeah so let's see fine so here you can see we have defined some control volumes and all so here this is the Reynolds transport theorem the derivation which you can uh, see of course so basically if this is the control volume which i am fixing then system at time t and control volume control volume is fixed is what i have assumed during this derivation so but control volumes can actually move depending on the you know type of device like for example you take ship as your control volume ship moves ship, ship is not stationary okay so if you do a bit of mathematical understanding you can finally by applying certain limits then writing expressions for properties and all you will finally end up this with this equation okay so this equation is the equation which connects the change of property of the control volume to the change of property of the system with some other term this is the net efflux which is leaving the control volume and this equation which is actually here is given by the Reynolds and it's called the Reynolds transport theorem and this equation is valid for any property okay like chemical potential temperatures okay velocities uh, you can put momentum whatever you keep density you can keep sometimes okay so whatever the properties you keep definitely this quantity will be uh, this equation is actually valid okay so that's why it's called the general transport transport equation and this equation is given by the Reynolds okay so this is called RTT now anyway instead of deriving this I'll just explain you how this equation is to be applied okay because right now the time is short if i keep deriving this it takes some time so i'll explain you how to apply this equation for the cases of linear momentum conserva i mean conservations basically okay mass momentum and also energy conservations clear okay so let's see if you see the equation if b is any property of the system then db by dt the rate of change of property of the system is equal to do by dot t of integral over the control volume beta times over dv plus cyclic integral over s let's say this is the control surface s for example because if we want to have a volume then definitely that should be uh, you know bounded in some surface so double integral over s beta times over v r bar relative velocity dot n cap dA don't get afraid by seeing this integral signs and all first thing that I would like to say is whenever in technical subjects you see maths don't be afraid because you all know how to do integrations and in multiple integrals also in first class first day of my I have told you how to work out the multiple integrals okay so if you have multiple integrals fine just they are lengthy but not complicated things okay so anyway let's see what are these terms actually now okay so let's see if you have this term beta beta is property per unit mass property per unit mass means for example if you take the capital B this can be written as mass into beta of course okay or beta may be written as capital B divided by M 
So what is the property you take? So beta is the intensive of that property. Okay. If you have already taken intensive property, then corresponding ratio, like for example, density by mass, one by specific vol specific volume. Okay. You will write these kind of things. That's it. Okay. Now let's see how this equation is applied. Okay. What does this term actually denotes? This first of all, this term denotes rate of change of property of the system. Rate of change of property of system of system this is a rate of change of property change of property of control volume of control volume and this term is actually the net rate of property net rate of property leaving the control volume leaving the control volume actually here okay so leaving the control volume actually in this case okay so you can see beta is the property per unit mass now can anyone tell me of a small area da for example if i pick some small area da on this surface let's say here i have taken some small area da on the surface then definitely if i want to calculate what is the mass flow through this small da because fluid can come in and fluid can leave to different points so here if this is the n cap direction then mass flow which is leaving this control volume means uh, through this elemental surface is given by rho times v r bar dot n cap da yes or no you all have seen this correct like for example if you have a if you want to calculate flow okay if you have a pipe okay if you want to if i ask you what is discharge you will say average velocity into area of cross section of the flow why you are taking area of cross section because if you want to apply the formula rho a v your area and flow velocity should be perpendicular to each other. Only then your OAV is correct. Otherwise, it's actually the dot product. Okay. So because if you apply dot product, then definitely what happens? N dot dA gives you the component perpendicular to this dA, which is in the direction of the velocity. Clear? Is this clear to all of you? So this is actually the mass flow rate. So you can see this value, which is here, is actually the elemental mass, which is leaving through this control surface dA. Okay. So if dA is the small elemental area, this term right here so this term denotes the mass flow which is leaving that control volume through this elemental volume uh, i mean through this elemental surface da and if the mass has a property beta per unit mass then if m dot is leaving the control volume through that small area da m dot into this beta gives you the amount of property which is leaving the control volume to this da in a given time okay and obviously at different points you have mass interactions so you have to integrate that quantity over the complete control surface that's it okay when you integrate it over the complete surface you will get the net change which is leaving the control volume okay so that's nothing but the rate of change of property and this is equal to db by dt of the system which basically comes from this derivation which we have done normally in in, in all in all my classes generally i do this okay in comprehensive classes okay not in the short and fast tags but in the comprehensive courses i do this okay so these are the equations now let's see how we can apply this equation to different uh, things actually is this clear to all of you please type in the chat box so first of all please type in the chat box is this clear to all of you Okay. And you can see this rho dv gives you small elemental mass. Okay. So rho into dv gives you delta m, small amount of mass. Okay. So if this is small amount of mass, small amount of mass into beta gives you small amount of property in a small volume. If you have to integrate that over the complete volume, you will get this term denotes the total property B of the control volume actually. Okay. Because this is rho dv, elemental mass dm. This is beta b into dm gives you d into b actually a small property actually here and this is rate of change of the con total uh, control uh, total property of the control volume actually. So question on RTT yeah definitely I have said some four nice questions some on linear momentum some on angular momentum I have said this but first of all let's have some uh, detailed discussion on RTT okay for just some 10-15 minutes we'll discuss RTT in detail then we'll see uh, directly applying to examples clear so let's see. So, if B is equal to, for example, mass, okay, so let's say B I have taken as mass, then can anyone tell me, B can be any quantity, so beta is mass by mass, which is 1. If you apply this equation, RTT, let's see what you'll get, dm by dt of system, okay, 
डो बाय डो टी ऑफ इंटीग्रल ऑफ द कंट्रोल वॉल्यूम बीटा बीटा इज वन सो वन टाइम्स ओ डी प्लस इंटीग्रल ऑफ द कंट्रोल सरफेस क्लोज कंट्रोल सरफेस एस बीटा इज वन रो वी आर बार डॉट एन कैप डी ए फॉर एग्जाम्पल ओके सो दिस इज द इक्वेशन वेन यू अपलाइड फॉर मास ओके पी एन ई वन मोर टाइम वॉट इज पी एन ई डेंट गेट दिस सम पार्ट ऑफ दिस यू वॉन्ट मी टू टीच वन मोर टाइम एक्चुअली previously this part out of this you know out of this portion you want me to teach something again ishan sorry uh, sorry if i'm wrong ishan ivan ishan yep it's fine right so let's go to the things so here if you simplify this equation let's see what you have i told you system is defined defined by some set of particles okay by some set of particles actually now when i define the system by some set of particles whatever the time happens okay so let's say if time changes but the identity of the system doesn't change okay so if the identity of the system is not changing and if the mass of the particles is fixed definitely so with time the mass of the system doesn't change as yes or no can you all understand this because let's say for example 10 particles i am putting together calling it a system wherever these 10 particles go my definition of the system doesn't change and since mass of the each particle is not changing so mass of my system is also fixed so if mass of my system is fixed what could be this term can anyone tell me what could be dm by dt of the system can anyone tell about what is dm by dt of the system what is dm by dt of the system if mass of the system is fixed zero correct so basically it is zero because the system is identified by some set of particles and the particles do not change with time obviously and the particles mass do not change so definitely the rate of change of mass of the system will be zero okay so this quantity is zero actually okay now coming to this this is a volume integral and this is a surface integral i'll apply one thing you all might have studied gauss divergence theorem gauss divergence theorem okay so gauss divergence theorem tells you over the surface if you have any integration of any quantity like for example f bar dot n cap ds for example okay so if you have this then this quantity it can be written as okay so f bar dot n cap ds can be written as integral over the volume v divergence of f dv correct so this is what you actually get okay so this is the divergence theorem basically converts surface integrals to volume integrals of course you don't have evaluation of gauss integral gauss divergence theorem in uh, you know evaluation of this gauss divergence theorem in uh, uh, what do you say the xc syllabus actually but in mechanical and all we might have done this n number of times so this connects surface integral close its surface integral to the volume integral actually okay so this collects surface integral to the volume integral so is rtt avoided because in lilian or lagrangian approach wouldn't account for change of control volume see rtt basically connects this eulerian approach with the lagrangian approach clear because when you are identifying a control volume for example okay if you identify a control volume then that control volume is a fixed region in space and we observe the nature of particles which are falling into the control volume but at the same time eulerian approach is system based approach okay so you focus on some particles actually so when these particles are moving you when you are observing the particles the rate of change of system okay the rate of change of quantity of the system is due to eulerian approach because you are fixing some particles some system you are fixing and you are observing how this system behavior is changing at the same time you are also looking at the control volume you have fixed some region in space some position in space and you are observing how the things of this space are changing so it connects actually the eulerian approach with the lagrangian approach clear fine uh, anjani kumar sir what about som and em i think apurv sir might have uh, told about this okay apurv sir and ramanand sir might have taken a call so definitely maybe uh, sometime soon maybe tomorrow or on friday i think they can speak something okay yeah okay uh prem raj i think it's fine right what we are talking yeah here so what i'm doing is i'll fix this as one vector okay so let's say density is just a scalar so i can uh, multiply a scalar and a vector and keep it as a vector so if i apply gauss divergence theorem this second term will convert to or basically this complete equation gets converted to zero is equal to do by do t of integral over the control volume rho dv plus 
double integral over the control surface S that can be written as triple integral over the volume V rho V divergence of rho velocity vector of course a relative we can have maybe into dv okay so this is dv now let's say in this analysis the small control volume what you are choosing is not changing with time then you can swap these two things okay because if you calculate the derivative of this quantity and then you integrate or you calculate the total uh, volume and then you integrate then you differentiate things doesn't change okay so if this control volume is not changing with time let's say i have fixed my control volume it's not deforming or something then in that case zero is equal to integral over the easian v do rho by dot t plus divergence of rho v bar is equal into dv is equal to zero of course okay so this is equal to zero now tell me one thing the choice of control volume is purely arbitrary means like for example you see if i give you something like this integral a to b f of x dx for example okay if i am telling you this is a con this is zero for every limits whatever you keep in place of a and b it doesn't matter it is always coming out to be zero then that means obviously this function has to be zero correct this is the fundamental theorem of calculus fundamental lemma of calculus actually so independent of these limits if this integration is directly giving you zero at any point then definitely this function has to be zero and same applies to the surface integrals volume integrals whatever the cases okay so here you can see from this using rtt you try to get this point this actually implies do rho by dot t plus divergence of rho v bar is actually equal to zero and have you all seen this equation so please tell me which equation is this because many of you might have derived this using some cubical block okay then taking the mass flow rate going mass flow rate coming out all the things okay here basically we are doing the same thing okay but in a shorter form using vectors that's all no, normally if you want to derive this continuity equation you will take a cubical element then m dot is gold flowing in m dot plus dou by dou x of m dot x is coming out m dot y is going in you might have taken all these terms okay all these six components we have kept in single term which is this okay and this is the rate of change of mass in the system and this is uh, sorry of the control volume and this is of the system actually okay so this is nothing but your continuity equation and guys one important point mass conservation equation generalized mass conservation equation yeah of course i want to tell you one important point here this is continuity equation when the equations are in vector form you can apply in any uh, uh, any, any systems okay i mean the cartesian or polar or spherical systems okay we will modify the divergence accordingly we are using cartesian or uh, you know uh, polar or spherical okay so this equation is called continuity equation of course continuity equation clear it's a generalized continuity equation actually clear so this equation you see if you know rtt one two three steps that's it okay this is just for your understanding i have written conversion of surface to volume integral using god divergence theorem but normally if you know this divergence theorem one two three steps is what all it need to derive the continuity equation so are you appearing this time hmm yeah i am appearing let's see what happens okay let's see if 10 can be brought to something down clear or maybe sometimes it can blow up also it can it can depend See, I'm telling you now. Even in your case, I'm not telling because I have got this. But even in your case, uh, ideal flow, potential flow. Okay, I'll come there. Okay, last module of today's class is potential flows. I'll tell you guys. Till if you uh, see within the first 50 ranks at least. Okay, all India one to all India 50 somewhere in between. So if you see, there won't be difference in mindset of the students or knowledge levels of the students. Only that day, because of some presence of mind or you know few very little issues, will actually. Keep the things deviate. That's it. Okay. Otherwise, whatever is the things with first, same will be that with uh, 50 or uh, you know till 50, 60 ranks. There won't be much difference actually. Clear? It's not like I am 10 or you are 60 something like that. Everyone is equal. But the only thing is only that little things of calculus and mistakes or simple presence of mind. These these things uh, change. So when is the new batch for 2025? Uh, you can just follow the YouTube channels. Okay, time to time. We keep launching the batches. Okay, there will be orientation sessions, so you can you can have a view at them. Clear? So anyway, let's get into the linear momentum. If v is equal to mass into velocity vector, maybe a relative velocity if fluid is flowing, then and the control volume is also moving. Okay, if you have this equation, then this implies your beta is equal to v r. Correct? So because if you divide this equation with mass, mass and mass gets cancelled, so you have this v r bar. So let's see if we apply this equation dv by dt of the system is equal to shall i write, okay i'll write one time because you can so integral over the control volume beta times rho dv 
plus then after uh, beta times over dv plus over the surface integral v of uh, beta times rho v dot n cap da okay so this is the equation actually guys this is a bit important so please be careful actually as I, as i told you this term denotes the small elemental mass which is leaving del m dot so which is leaving basically through this small elemental area d at the uh, at the surface okay so if you take the steady state operation for example if things are steady steady state then dou by dot t of control volume if control volume is operating under steady state then with the time the change of quantity of the control volume will be zero because it's a, a time derivative so definitely this term is actually zero in this case okay if the things are steady because at gate syllabus we have seen majority only steady things are coming even if you want unsteady then this won't be zero that's it you have to evaluate okay but anyway if you deal the case of steady state then this term is actually zero because i told you this term denotes the quantity b of the control volume at any given time okay so this is the uh, value of the quantity b of the control volume if you are derivating this partially with respect to time under steady state the quantity b of the control volume do not change with time so if you differentiate it partially with time this quantity goes to zero actually okay now in this steady state let's see d by dt of momentum of the system is equal to coming to this control or s can I write this as del m dot v r bar for example okay just for simplicity I'm writing okay so what does this quantity actually tells you look when you take a system for example if you take some mass okay so let's say these are the particles fixed particles okay so this is some finite amount of mass so as per Newton's second law you know something if this is some amount of mass the rate of change of momentum of this mass is equal to what Molly, get ESC. Sorry, I'm from SRK. Oh, hi. Come on. What is this? Tell me. Then you are from SRK. You should tell this. Okay. Basically, SRK is the same college where I did my bachelor's. Okay. Yeah. So this is nothing but, you know, what is this? Newton's second law. Force applied, right? So this is sigma F. I, I would say sigma because this is the net force acting. Okay. Net force acting is equal to, and mass is constant. So if you throw this mass out, mass into acceleration is what you have Newton's second law, of course. Okay. So this implies net force acting on the system. Net force acting on the system is equal to, what does this expression actually tells you? Look, I want to tell you one thing. If you have this control volume, for example, this equation is the most generalized equation. So if you have DA, it talks about the mass flows at all points okay it assumes that there is mass interaction at all points of this control surface okay like for example you take this as the control surface which is bounding the control volume in this equation we have taken da and we have integrated but in reality what happens if you take any quant any control volume that control volume has some finite number of inlets and finite number of outlets like for example you take your water tank at home it has maybe one inlet okay and maybe one outlet okay so or if you take some industrial devices like code distillation columns and all you have one inlet and multiple outlets like for example five to six outlets so in general the number of inlets and number of outlets are actually finite okay and this quantity talks about the net rate of fluid or the net rate of quantity which is leaving the control volume in this case it's fluid okay so you can see if i write this if i break this summation let's say if i have some finite number of inlet points okay and maybe some finite number of outlet points okay i have some finite number of inlets and finite number of outlets then clearly at this portion there is no mass flux which is going means this quantity at this part is zero actually similarly at this part it is zero at this part it is zero because there no mass is actually cutting the control surface okay so at these regions no mass is actually cutting the control surface clear so at all these regions no mass is cutting the control surface then what we do we split up the integration because now the distribution of mass is not continuous it is uh, into some finite number of inlets and outlets we break it up and write m dot v r at outlets minus summation m dot v r at inlets how this minus sign is coming that's the main important thing because i told you this term brings, brings the net outlet okay net uh, quantity which is leaving the control volume when you are leaving the control volume try to understand something if you take this control volume for example okay you take this elemental area da let me take here da for example the outward normal is this n cap and let's say the velocity at that point may be something like this. Okay, so let's say the velocity is in this direction. Then clearly, 
at this surface the outward normal is directed outside if fluid is leaving velocity is also in this direction so if you take the angle between these two then definitely this theta will be less than 90 at the outlets okay at the outlets the angle theta is less than 90 and when you do this dot product definitely if you do this dot product you know there's a dot here i think it got measured in the bracket if you do the dot product of this velocity and n cap since the angle between theta angle between them theta is less than 90 this term becomes positive so wherever there is leaving this term becomes positive actually at the points where it's entering inside i'll show you see at the points where it's entering in for example you take a da here small elemental da here at this point n cap is actually like this but the velocity because the fluid is going inside maybe the velocity is something like this then clearly you can see the angle between them is more than 90 okay so at the inlet this dot product v dot n becomes negative because the angle theta is more than 90 and if that angle is more than 90 this dot product becomes negative so when you are splitting this term into inlets and outlets for the inlets this becomes a minus sign is this clear to all yeah up to use angle is formed between the velocity vector and the n-cap directions clear to all yes or no okay See, it's very easy, okay? Just see, I'm telling you in fluid mechanics, if you want to learn something, not at the level of CFD at least, but at the normal, uh, you know, analytical analytical uh, fluid mechanics level, the only thing you know is little details on solving differential equations, small differential equations, which we have seen, like, you know, last class also, we have seen some partial differential equations, and basic simple operations of vectors, like the cross product, dot product, okay, rotation, these kind of things. If you know these things, then even equations which are looking big can be easily understood using fluid mechanics, uh, using, using this elemental math concepts. Okay, so let's see. So I hope you understood. So in this, it tells you sigma f of the system, sigma f acting on the system is equal to m dot v r at the outlet minus summation m dot v r at the inlet. So this is basically the difference between all these things. Clear? Okay, now let us solve some questions to understand how we apply this equation. Okay, two questions important, nice questions I have set. So we'll solve those two questions and then we will see how to apply this equation for angular momentum and we will see the case of tub, uh, I mean this uh, applications of angular momentum like the launch sprinklers, okay, some inlet to the turbines, disks and all these things. Okay, clear? So let's get into this. So I'll give you some time. So please solve this question. I'll conduct a poll also if you have understood. Okay, first question I'll solve by myself. Second question, I'll conduct a poll. Okay, so let's see. A tank of water sits on a cart. You see, there's a cart here and there's a tank of water which is sitting on this cart. Okay, with frictionless wheels. You see, at this wheels, there is no friction. The cart is attached using a cable to a mass 10 kg. Okay, so this is 10 kg mass, of course. Okay, so this mass is 10 kg. This mass is 10 kg. The coefficient of static friction of the mass with the ground is mu is equal to 0 0.55. Okay, so mu is equal to 0 0.55 at this, of course, you cannot see here. I think uh, you can send this inside. No, I think I cannot send this inside. Fine. So I hope you can understand there's a floor and there's a block sitting on it so that there's a friction between the block and the floor, of course. Okay. If the gate blocking the tank exit is removed, so let's say, for example, if I'm removing this exit gate, okay, so this gate is here, which is blocking this outlet of the fluid, so I'm removing this gate. By the time I remove this gate, definitely fluid actually flows inside, okay, flows in this direction. So if fluid starts flowing in this direction, then definitely because of the reaction force, like you might have seen, now, if you take a gun, if the bullet goes in the forward direction, your gun ripple back, okay. So same thing, whenever the fluid actually leaves, this tank actually moves, uh, you know, uh, back. So when this tank is moving, the value of mass m that is just sufficient to hold the tank means here for safety you have tied 10 gauges, but what could be the mass m which is just sufficient to stop this cart? Uh, you, you don't want to move this cart actually, you want to keep that cart fixed. So what should be the minimum mass or the just sufficient mass m to keep this cart stationary? Okay, so let's see. I would like to answer this. So this is a mechanics problem, but we use some fluid mechanics principles to solve this. That's why it's fluid mechanics. So first of all, if you draw the equilibrium of the block, okay? So let's say this block has mass m, then clearly if you draw the free body diagram, this is weight and this is the normal reaction from the floor, okay? And there is a tension in the cable because if the cart is trying to move in this direction, then there is a tension in the cable, then there is a tension t in the cable and obviously it sh you should have some reaction, friction force acting in the reverse direction, okay? So let's see, these are tension mu n which is the frictional force then this is weight of the block and this is normal reaction 
So under these conditions, this block is in static equilibrium. So if you get sigma fx is equal to zero and sigma fy is equal to zero combinedly, you will end up tension in the cable should be equal to mu times of w. Yes or no? Correct? Because mu times of n should be balanced by t, but sigma fy gives you n and w are equal. So you can replace this n with this w. So t is equal to mu into w. Now, what about this case? Okay, in the tension, if you t if this string is in tension, definitely then let's see. And obviously, if this cart is trying to move, and if the block is trying to stop, that string will be tight between the cart and the block. Actually, okay. Now, if I lift this, see what happens. If I lift this gate, then definitely fluid starts coming out at this angle. Okay, so fluid starts coming out at this angle. Okay, so let's say v is the velocity of the fluid which is coming out. Now, for the movement of the tank, sigma f acting on tank in x direction is equal to minus t yes or no so for example if sigma force if force acting on the cart is in this direction then definitely tension will be in the opposite direction clear yes or no so sigma fx on the tank is actually equal to this tension in the cable clear now let's see sigma fx acting on the cart can also be written as minus sigma f on fluid on fluid in the x direction is equal to minus t of course okay so this minus and this minus cancels why see i'll tell you like Newton's third law of motion, when two bodies are in contact with each other, like here the fluid and tank are in contact with each other, then definitely force acting on the fluid is equal to minus of force acting on the tank. Yes or no? So therefore, force acting on the tank is nothing but minus of force acting on the fluid. So this is the equation. So let's see. Sigma f on fluid in x direction is equal to tension t in the cable and t is equal to mu times of w which is mu mg for example okay so now let's see what is sigma fx on tank now come back to the Sinol's transport theorem so sigma f acting on the system now system is mass basically in this fluid so let's say if the fluid is leaving out at velocity v this tank is the control volume you take the control volume let's see you take this control volume actually here in this case when you take this control volume can you find at any point on this control volume, basically this is the control surface, okay, so this is the control surface, at any point on the control surface, is there any fluid which is cutting the control surface and coming inside? At any point, can you see, is there any fluid which is coming inside the control volume by cutting the control surface? In this, please type in the chat box. At any location on the control surface, can you see any fluid cutting the control surface and coming inside? No, correct? You're not able to see that, right? Yes, there's no fluid which is cutting the control surface and coming inside into the control volume. So therefore, in this equation, if you write sigma fx, sigma fx on fluid, summation m dot v, at the outlet in the x direction minus summation m dot v x in the inlet because this is a vector we have written in this x component direction so this velocity also should be in x component directions okay so let's see this term is actually zero because at the inlet there is no mass which is coming in okay so that term is actually zero now coming to this first term m dot so let's see how many outlets you have. So first of all, you have only single outlet, only the fluid is leaving only at this point. So this, we have only one term, one combination of m dot v. So m dot into velocity in the x direction at the outlet. So at outlet, fluid is leaving in this direction, but the x component is given by v cos 60, okay? So v cos 60. So the exit velocity in the x direction is v cos 60, which is one by two. And what is m dot? m dot is rho, area into velocity into v by 2. So this is rho a v square by 2 actually. Clear to all of you? Did you all understand how did I generate this expression for the net force acting on the fluid? Clear to all? Okay, because see this fluid is completely exposed to atmosphere. This is atmosphere and this is atmosphere. So there is no net uh, uh, forces due to pressures. Like in, I'll tell you one more case. Okay, so first look at this. Are you all clear with this expression? Rho a v square by 2. Did you all understand how did this come? 28.55 is wrong, I think, because if 10 kg is holding, then definitely you don't need minimum mass as 28.55 kg. Okay, maybe check your calculation once. So this is the force which is acting on the fluid actually, and that's equal to the tension. So here if you equate rho a v square by 2 is equal to mu mg, and 
this implies your mass is equal to density a v square by 2 mu g of course clear so this is the equation for the mass which could just hold it in equilibrium without allowing the car to move okay so let's put the values i think some numericals are given so density of the fluid so what is the density of the fluid because mass fluid is multiplied with density uh, what is this fluid water okay so water so then take density as 10 cube area of the jet okay because oh, av flow area this d is of diameter 50 mm okay so you can see this arrow mark is going so it's a uh, cylindrical hole of diameter 50 mm so pi by 4 d square pi by 4 d square 50 mm is 5 centimeters so 0 0.05 meters whole square okay so this is what you have pi by 4 d square into then velocity square velocity square so what is the velocity here that you don't know okay so velocity is not known to you so how do you calculate velocity you apply the Bernoulli's equation we'll get the velocity apply the Bernoulli's equation at this point and at this exit point clearly so this elevation gap is of course you, you neglect this small curvature effect so this point is at a height of 2 mm so you call this point a for example and you call this point maybe uh, b okay so you call this point b if you apply Bernoulli's equations we get p a by o g plus v a square by 2 z plus z a elevation of z is equal to p b by o z plus v b square by 2 z plus z b actually in this case okay now try to understand something guys look look at this uh, thing actually p v by o z plus v b square by 2 z plus z b actually now this is open to atmosphere this is also open to atmosphere so definitely p a and p b the pressures at these two locations are atmospheres because it's open to atmosphere so p a and p b this term can be cancelled why since p a is equal to p b of course okay is equal to p a t m in this case p a t m local clear now coming to v a square and v b square let's see if this is a 50 mm diameter tank uh, diameter hole so with that means 5 centimeters hole okay so it's a large tank for example then when fluid is leaving the velocity at which this water level comes down will be very slow as well no? like for example if fluid is leaving then the water level comes down very slowly maybe few mm per second so we will neglect that velocity okay so the velocity of these particles in this direction is neglected so v a square so the kinetic energy per unit weight this is approximately zero and now if you choose for example this is the datum then this point a is at an elevation of 2 meters from this point b okay so compared to point b point a is at an elevation of 2 meters then definitely if you take this as 0 then definitely this is 2 right so this tells you your velocity b square is equal to 2 g into 2 which is 4 g 4 into 9.81 meter square per second square of course we'll see, leave it like this okay anyhow we need the value of v square only so we'll keep the value of v square so v square value is 4 g this is 4 g divided by 2 into mu so what about mu coefficient of friction so mu is 0 0.55 so 0 0.55 into g of course okay so g is there here so what we can do g g can be cancelled this 4 and 4 can be cancelled this 2 can be cancelled 500 times here so this 500 into 0 0.05 square so the value is 500 into pi into 0 0.05 square divided by 0 0.55 that's what okay so this value is in kgs so this is the minimum mass which is required to just keep that in this case okay so actually questions are harder as compared to mechanical yeah but this time mechanical also mechanical paper is not tough this year to be frank yeah i am telling you mechanical paper if you are uh, uh, normally uh, under college going student and if you are thorough with all the basic concepts you can answer that paper okay mechanical paper was not tough Mechanic, uh, in math there were one two questions which were tough as I told you on that day also but technical I think paper was not tough not only me even the complete team felt that okay fine anyway don't bother about mechanical you know mechanical exam is just one exam in your life that's it finished okay now focus on the another exams I'm telling you guys many students tell this like uh, sir gate itna achana you are so ab kya karo mein? I'm telling you gate is just one of the entries and one of the See, uh, you know one of the possibilities that's it okay gate is not the ultimate thing clear even if xc goes bad don't worry because there are plenty of exams which you could without gate examination understood so like for example when i cleared brc uh, you know when i cleared back okay so 
my selection was to the separate exam which conducts uh, which brc conducts okay my gate score was not good enough that year to get shortlisted for the interview but you know uh, the selection is based on 100% interview so i have nailed it and i got into the brc okay so that's why start your preparation okay preparation is a process as i always tells you once you start this within the 6 months or 7 months you will be at that level where your knowledge level is in good way and you can directly you know clear each and every exam so your name is there in college <laughs> thank you yeah but i hope in a good way okay <laughs> yeah so let us simplify this guy what it gives you so you take the calculator punch some keys you will get the answer 500 into pi into uh, you know 0.05 square 0.05 square actually this guy divided by 0.55 divided by 0.55 okay 7.14 roughly 7.14 kgs 7.1399 so 7.14 kgs clear yeah 7.14 kgs is the minimum mass which you need just to keep this guy cart not moving here okay so 7.14 roughly yeah 7.14 kgs did you understand basically how to use this equation and to get the expressions this is the main thing okay why i have solved this example is this example covers three equations uh, i mean three concepts actually one equilibrium of the bodies two applying this rtt third this bernoulli's equation for calculating the velocity so this concept involves the this question involves three concepts so i have given this here okay okay guys is that clear to all of you okay is this clear to all of you each and every one please type in the chat box did you understand how this conversion is made it's based simple based on newton's third law so only one problem is this whenever i sit for study after 30 minutes i got distracted or get bored of how to study for more continuous hours practice okay whenever you i understand okay <laughs> even when in my first attempt i'll tell you i expected some uh, gate rank in my preparation during my preparation time but unfortunately exam didn't go fine of course it's good enough to get into iit madras but not very good as i have expected and obviously as a 21 years or 20 years kid not kid okay fine okay 20 years or 21 years i was not very happy okay so immediately i started okay from today onwards i'll study 10 hours 10 10 hours per day without any distractions i'll i'll you know clear this that everything okay but <laughs> the reality is i was not able to study even for one hour or two hours okay because the reason is your body or your mind is adjusted in such a way that you are not acquainted or basically you are not ready to sit for long hours because after entering btech you know majority of the students they don't take education as very serious thing and ultimately they bunk many classes and go here and there this kind of things happen and basically to keep mind focused for long hours is not uh, one common practice that happens with engineering students okay so practice okay so you start today maybe start sitting for half an hour daily without any distraction then slowly push that half an hour to one hour one hour to one and a half so if you can keep this happen within next two three months you will be able to maintain this uh, you know structured mindset for longer okay everything comes with practice so please repeat in short yeah i am repeating so first of all whenever the fluid is actually leaving this then definitely the reaction force on the tank will be towards left okay that's what you can see so when the reaction force in the tank is towards left this tank tries to move towards left but this block is actually preventing this is the physics okay now let's put in equations if you want the equilibrium first of all for the equilibrium of the block this is what you have so this gives you this equation then equilibrium of the cart you see this tension force acting in this direction is equal to minus of sigma ft on tank okay because these two have to be in opposite directions okay and similarly sigma f on tank is in opposite to sigma f on fluid so minus sense cancel now sigma f on fluid in the x direction in the x direction okay i have it an fx so sigma fx on fluid is this now since there is no points at which fluid is coming in this v inlets are zero now outlet is there is only one point so at that one point we calculate m into v product okay so if you calculate this m dot v product this is the expression you got so this expression should be equal to tension t in the uh, string actually okay so if you see this is the expression but here you don't know what is v square to get the v square we have applied bernoulli's between two points and to uh, get the v square value so once you substitute you can just use a calculator and get the value 7.14 kg clear to all of you yes or no so please type in the chat box is this clear to each and every one okay now let's see one more question okay so after doing one more question we'll go for 
angular momentum case but i want you to solve this question i'll conduct a poll by now you have understood how to do the things so integer anti integer type i'm giving you 150 seconds okay so st start i have given you 150 seconds so let's see a tank shown in the figure has two nozzle exits this is one exit of the nozzle and this is another exit of the nozzle with De at different depths as shown so this is at a depth h this is at a depth 2h and this diameter is d1 and this diameter is d2 then the ratio of d1 by d2 is root k for the net force net horizontal force acting on the tank to be zero so for the net horizontal force acting on the tank to be zero what should be the value of d1 by d2 okay is root k the value of k is dash and an integer come on solve this i'll have some water and get back Okay, sir. So two, maybe you enter in the chat box quickly. Whatever you feel, you enter in the chat box. You will get the answer. Okay, so poll got ended. Let's see. First of all, because of these holes, fluid actually comes out in this vector velocity v one. Let's say, and here fluid goes out in this, which is v two. Okay, now let's take the control volume again. For example, you take as the control volume because net force acting on the tank is given. This open atmosphere, this datum head is given. So, and maybe at the bottom also you can see you can connect a line. Okay, now let's see if you have these uh, things. Okay, so first of all, net force acting on the cart. Net force. Horizontal force, okay. Sigma F X on tank, which is also equal to minus sigma F X on fluid, because the reaction will be in opposite direction, so that's minus is equal to zero, okay. So because you can see clearly, sigma F X on tank is equal to zero. So your explaining is good. Uh, thank uh, Harsha. So see here, sigma F X on tank, and this is sigma minus sigma F X on fluid, and this is going to be zero, of course, okay. Now let's see. So obviously, this gives you sigma F X acting on fluid. <coughs> on fluid is equal to zero. Okay. So what is sigma F X acting on fluid? Summation m dot V X at outlet minus summation m dot V X at the inlet is equal to zero. Okay. Now this is the equation. Now clearly, if you see this control volume again, if you see this control surface at any point, this potential flow ka topic detail. Topic detail lecture le sakte ho kya? Yeah, I'll take detailed lecture abhi. Okay, so no issues. We'll start from scratch and we'll build up up to superposition of flows. Okay, so anyway, let's see here. So this is m dot v x out minus sigma m dot v x in is equal to zero. Okay, now clearly, if you see this control control surface, there is nothing which is going inside the control surface. So clearly, this term is again zero. There is no inlet velocity into the control surface at any point. So that's zero. Now this implies summation m dot v x. at the outlet is equal to 0 so let's see how many outlets are there there are two outlets 
one here and the second one here okay so let's say here the velocity is v1 and there the velocity is v2 so at the outlet one let's say m dot vx at outlet one plus because it's a summation so uh, sum basically is equal to zero so this gives you m dot vx1 so m dot vx1 is nothing but rho into or uh, let's take the next page because it's good sorry yeah okay so what is this product at this section one well, for example you call this outlet one and this is outlet two actually okay so at outlet one if this diameter is d1 and the flow is coming out with velocity v1 the m dot value density pi by 4 d1 square into v1 so this is the mass flow rate at section 1 and this mass flow rate is coming at a velocity vx in the direction of minus v1 did you understand why we have taken minus v1 because if you take generally that this is the standard x and y directions then definitely this velocity v1 is in the opposite in the negative x direction okay so that's why for this v1 i have taken a minus sign here clear so this vx at outlet 1 is minus v1 because the velocity is inclined towards the negative x axis plus m dot v at second location so rho into pi by 4 d2 square v2 into now coming to the velocity so this velocity is directed towards positive x so clearly you have a v2 is equal to zero of course in this case now let's see rho cancels pi by 4 cancels because this rho into pi by 4 is common in both the terms okay so this tells you minus d1 square v1 square plus d2 square v2 square is equal to zero so this actually tells you what you want of course d1 by d2 fine if you want d1 by d2 this is equal to v1 by v2 of course okay so this is the simple relation which you got now your job is to get what is the values of v1 and v2 so that you get the ratio so how do you get the value of v1 just apply Bernoulli's equations maybe at this point and at this point so again pa if you call these points a and this point b for example then well this total energy at a is same as total energy at b so if you write pa by oa plus v a square by 2 z plus z a is equal to p b by o z plus v b square by 2 z plus z b actually here okay now let's see this p a by o z and p b by o z are equal okay because these two points are open to atmosphere and clearly it's a large tank so if things are going at to some finite inlets this water level comes down very slowly is what we are taking so velocity at a is zero and if this point b is taken as the datum or basically the difference between these two points is h so if b is zero then definitely this point is h so you can understand your vb from this location which is of course v1 is equal to root 2g h if you do the same thing for points a and c maybe c is somewhere here okay so you do the points between a and c you will eventually end up similarly i would like to write similarly your vc is equal to v2 which is square root of 2g times 2h because the gap between these two is 2h this time okay so this is root 2g h h is the gap between this so similarly if you apply the same equation between a and c this is what you'll get therefore d1 by d2 square root of 2g h divided by 2z into 2h okay so 2z into 2h is what you get okay so this is 2z into 2h clear so d2 d1 by d2 is equal to v1 uh, just a minute guys i think it is like d1 v2 by v1 no? this is v2 by v1 okay because it's a ratio so v2 by v1 so this is v2 by v1 so in this case this is square root of 2z 2h divided by 2z h actually in this case okay so if you simplify we'll get 2z 2z h h gets cancelled and this value is equal to square root of 2 that's it okay so d1 by d2 is square root of 2 and here this value is given as square root of k so obviously k is 2 okay so k value is 2 got it yes or no so is this clear to all of you did you understand how to apply the equations basically how to apply this equation yeah so let's see if some of you have entered 2 let me check okay none of you maybe yeah mostly i think we have told before time but you haven't entered okay anyway it's fine 
Guys, I just want to give you one thing. Here, these are open to atmosphere directly. So we are considering force on fluid is only because of force on tank. But in reality, what happens? Let's say if you have a combustion chamber. Let's say, for example, you have a jet engine, something like this, and you are testing it in lab. Okay. So when you are testing it, let's say, if this is the control volume, which you are taking. Then here you see the fluid is going in with velocity v1 and the fluid is leaving out with velocity v2 and let's say this is operating under steady state okay steady because otherwise you know this mass cannot sit inside okay large amount of mass cannot sit inside then definitely uh, things has to go okay now let's see here at this section at the inlet at the inlet if the pressure is actually p1 and here the area is A, of course. And at these locations, if the pressure is P2, of course, okay. So this is P2. And if this area is A, now at this location, if the pressure is P2, the projection, the acting of the projection, if you take in the x direction, sigma fx in the x directions. So sigma fx, you take in this directions, then the projection will give you P1 means sigma fx on fluid is equal to summation m dot v out in the x direction minus summation m, summation m dot v x in the inlet direction okay so that's in the inlet direction now let's see it has single inlet and single outlet so mass flow rate is same so it has m dot v2 minus v1 is what you have okay because m dot is constant you can write m dot as o a a1 v1 into O A is equal to O A to V2, anything you can write. But anyway, this if you see, now what is the force acting on the fluid? Like for example, you take this fluid as the portion. So if you take this fluid like this, I think the diagram is not looking good. Okay, so if you have this control volume, definitely because of this uh, you know device okay let's see if this is the fluid then this fluid is moving in a tank so definitely because of the tank you have some force due to tank sigma fx on by tank by a uh, device combustion chamber or device let's say by device or you can write sigma fx external for example okay so sigma fx external plus this p1 minus p2 times of a is equal to rho a v2 square minus v1 square maybe you can write this okay so here uh, because a is not constant so we'll write as rho a2 v2 square minus rho a1 v1 square actually in this case clear so this is the equation that you have normal in case of combustion chambers and things like this okay like for example sigma f external could be maybe something like this or maybe in the opposite direction you if this value comes out to be negative that means the force is acting in the negative if it comes in the positive it's towards the positive axis okay so this is x and this is y of course okay a1 clear so this is a1 because at this point if you project this pressure acting on the control uh, complete this uh, control uh, volume then definitely the projection will again lead to the area a1 so we have p1 minus p2 times a1 is equal to rho a2 v2 square minus rho a1 v1 square actually clear so i lost gate 2025 mp weapon i focus on bark doing exam which should I more focus speed or accuracy in bark it's like uh, you know don't be subtract force due to PATM this PATM is balanced because everywhere on the sounding it's PATM and the net is zero okay uh, doing exam which should I focus uh, accuracy okay because BRC is all about like I think you have 100 questions on 120 minutes as far as I remember yeah because it's been a couple of years back so uh, I think 100 questions and uh, 2 hours 120 minutes time okay so which is actually uh, accurate speed is fine but accuracy should also be is very important like you solve up to 60 questions it's fine but uh, solve them correctly okay yeah some may know your telegram channel yeah my telegram id is this if you wish you can join if you feel i can help you somewhere i can definitely join here okay so this is my telegram id clear in which gate we have to consider force due to PATM. Maybe if one side is 
if I say is there, then other side it's vacuum, things like that. Okay. But normally, if the device have open atmosphere, then we don't take the effect of atmospheric pressures. Clear? Even if you take, it gets cancelled on both sides. Okay. Let's say, for example, if this is open atmosphere, P A T M into A one and P A T M into A one. Then, if you add in these terms, it gets cancelled of it. When the device is completely open atmosphere, then definitely they cancel out. Okay. So anyway, this is the story of applying this Reynolds transport theorem to linear momentum. Now let us see the case of angular momentum. Okay. So. I think uh, this pressure should be somewhere here. Fine. Okay, so yeah, angular momentum. Applying RTT for angular momentum. Applying RTT for angular momentum. So what is angular momentum? You know, basically B. Let me take, for example, you take a plane. Okay, so you take a plane like this. Okay, when you take a plane like this, and let's say you take some, you define some axis, maybe something like this. Okay, so you take, you define some axis. Fine. So let's say this is the axis that you have, which is passing through maybe this point. Oh, okay. Now, let's say you have a particle which is moving along this path. Let's say, for example, you have a particle which is moving along some path like this. Okay, so there is a path path which is like this, and a particle is moving in a plane. Okay, when this or in space generally it can move. Okay, so whenever this particle is somewhere here, for example, let's say this particle is. Let me draw this curve neatly, a bit. I'll show you this case. So when this particle is moving like this. So here you have the particle or that mass m, whatever is the mass you have, basically. So that mass, if it's here, then the velocity of that mass will be definitely tangential to this direction. Yes or no? It lies in the plane, of course. So this will be like tangent here in this case. Okay. So this is the momentum vector, linear momentum vector. So this is basically a linear momentum vector, which is m v bar, or sometimes it's also m v r bar actually. So this is linear momentum vector, and you know angular momentum is nothing but the moment of this linear momentum correct so if you for example see the r vector like this this r vector is like this okay so this is r bar then this is horizon okay so your angular momentum which is moment of linear momentum so this gives you r cross mv bar okay and you know this is cos product of two vectors so definitely angular momentum is also a vector it has some sense like for example in this case if you take r and if you are going towards v then definitely you have this in the z direction okay or basically this is some direction say z then you have the angular momentum about that z direction so this is the angular momentum moment of the linear momentum is called angular momentum of course okay now let's see if you apply rtt for this so let v is equal to r cos m v r bar and this implies your beta is equal to if you divide with mass you have r cos v r in this case okay so beta is equal to r cos v r now let's see if you apply this r t t we get d by d t of r cos m v bar for the system for the system is equal to okay so this is for the system is equal to dou by dou t of integral or the volume v beta which is r cos v r rho d v this term plus over the control surface s beta times rho v r bar dot n cap d a this is the equation actually here okay so just you replace your beta as v r cos v so you have this okay and you know vector cos product cannot be interchanged matlab is not commutative a cos b is not equal to b cos a it's equal to minus b cos a actually okay because see how the vectors are done let's say you have this plane this is a and this is b for example then n cap is something like this okay so your n cap is basically the vector which is parallel to sorry which is perpendicular to this plane this is the plane actually then your n cap is this and how this n cap is given based on the right hand thumb rule you take at a 
and a if you rotate your fingers towards b then the thumb points out the end cap direction like for example in this case it comes out of the board like this okay but if you talk b cos a then starting at b and moving towards a your thumb is backwards so it reverses actually the direction of this end cap so the direction so a cos b and b cos a will have opposite signs of course okay so anyway this is just for the understanding because we are dealing with vector cross product here now let's see steady state you again take the case of steady state steady state this is zero okay so this vector is zero bar of course so if you take the steady state then nothing changes with time talk is also same like a bottle cap moment yeah basically as as long as you have right handed threads then right handed moment uh, right hand thumb will actually work okay so anyway let let's see this implies d by dt of angular momentum do you know what is the rate of change of angular momentum acting on a mass the rate of change of angular momentum, uh, rate of change of force, uh, rate of change of linear momentum acting on a body is actually force. So, what is this rate of change of angular momentum acting on a body? This is the yes torque. Okay, so this is sigma t torque acting on system, which is basically on fluid. Okay, system which means on fluid is equal to now coming to this. So r cos v. So you actually can write as summation m dot okay so m dot fine let's say m dot r cross v r at the outlet so this summation at the outlet minus summation m dot r cross v r this summation at the this summation at the inlet actually here okay so this is outlet and that's inlet of course here in this case okay so this is the equation which is also called as Euler's equation which we use as the basic for turbo machines like for example you take uh, you know you take a disc okay so let's say you take a disc let's say you have a disc like this okay for example if you have a disc like this For example, you have a disc like this, okay? So you have a disc like this. Now, when you have a disc like this, oh, and let's say this disc is about to rotate in this direction, for example, about this axis, okay? So the disc is rotating. Now, clearly, you have we have three directions one is the axial direction, z direction, one is the radial direction, and one is the theta direction, okay? Now, out of these three things, let's say if for example if fluid is coming and striking it okay for example some fluid is coming and striking it so when fluid is coming normally you can decompose this into three components in cylindrical r theta and z components okay whenever you take this then vr and vz the moments due to vr and vz do not contribute for any rotation of the torque the reason for this is look i'll tell you if you do r cos v okay mass is anyhow constant you uh, i mean sorry scalar you take it out of the cost product if you do this you'll see i j k then dou by dou r one by okay uh, a radial vector right so this is a radial vector so whenever you do this r cos v the rotation is about this z axis but the momentum due to okay no need of doing cost product i'll just explain you normally using these words so this if you multiply mass to this m dot vr m dot v theta m dot vz okay so let's say if the particle is coming now this m dot vr the velocity of m dot vr component will be towards the radius okay so whenever this is towards the radius then m dot vr momentum will actually act along the center okay clear principles of boundary theory very interesting invention of tesla yeah recently i have uh, gone through that okay uh, i mean three four days back i, I think i've seen somewhere but not into so much details okay anyway we'll see what is that a boundary layer theory turbine right yeah we'll see okay so let's see in this case this component will actually pass through the center this component vz will also pass through the center the component which is responsible for rotation of the wheel is basically this component okay is basically this component here so you can understand m v theta m v theta component the moment of this momentum will actually be helpful so if you keep this the rotation sigma torque on fluid 
which is basically in the direction perpendicular to the disk okay because you know if the rotation is in this plane if the rotation is in this plane then the torque acting will be tangential okay which is coming out of the plane actually so sigma t is actually given as sigma m dot v r into r at outlet minus sigma m dot v r into r this product at inlet actually here because i'll tell you one thing see if you have a disk for example if you have a disk like this I, i'm taking only plain view if you have a disk like this so you have the center here so let's say you have three components of velocity radial component theta component okay so this is the theta component and you have the z component of velocity which is something like this then z and radial pass to the origin uh, pass to this center okay so those two do not generate any moment for the rotation but if you take this tangential component let's see what you have if you take this tangential component of velocity this is radius r so if this is tangential component of velocity or uh, momentum mv theta if you do r cos mv theta into e theta cap for example if you do this you will understand something this is tangent and this is the radial vector radial and tangent are always perpendicular to each other yes or no correct m is mass that's it okay so m is mass of the fluid particle clear so you can see when you have r cos m v theta e theta cap actually here so this is the tangential component but this is the radial vector so r cos tangent so if you see what is the angle between that radial r bar and the tangential component of velocity which is v theta so can anyone tell me what is this angle between the tangential direction at that point and the radial direction what is this angle 90 okay so if this is 90 then in this case r cos v theta can be just written as r into okay v theta is just a component so if you write this as a vector component e theta cap for example then this just gives you a scalar because and of course the direction is perpendicularly k which is the axial direction of course so we know the disk rotates about the axis that's why this cross product gets eliminated and you just have v r into r okay so that's what can you explain about the potential function i'll explain why the last topic is potential flows okay we'll like talk about potential functions stream functions you know uh, superposition of flows basic flows everything clear so just stay for some time so this is anyway v theta of course you can just keep it to v because you know this is the azimuthal component of velocity okay so this is azimuthal component of velocity so we write v and of course uh, v relative okay sorry this r stands for relative so don't get confused between this r and this r here v r is basically relative velocity okay not the radial component of velocity it is a relative velocity is what i'm writing here in this case a relative velocity you might have seen in case of reaction turbines and all like francis turbine or something normally in case of reaction turbines or in case of a turbine actually what should happen the fluid should exert some torque on the disc okay means the force exerted by the fluid on the disc has to be positive means sigma acting on fluid has to be negative yes or no so basically if you see in in case of turbines turbines are power producing devices so when this fluid goes and hits the turbine blades okay or the turbine rotor then this fluid has to give certain energy it has to apply certain force on the rotor if fluid applying force on the rotor is positive then the reaction force is negative okay so this term has to be negative if this term has to be negative this term has to be negative which means in a nutshell if you have only one inlet and one outlet some radius r inlet has to be greater than r outlet and you see any turbine francis any reaction turbines okay so you take any turbine actually of course in axial machines you don't show much variation but in case of any reaction turbine where reaction principles are involved this r in is definitely greater than r out you take francis turbine for example okay francis turbines you have seen in your lab definitely outlet will be at higher radius and inlet is at very small radius okay this is the reason for that if you, in case of pumps you see in case of pumps inlet will be at small radius outlet will be at larger radius okay like for example you see pump a sucks inside okay and outlet is at periphery of the wheel okay so all these equations are guided by this equation okay so let's see so anyway why we are talking about all these things is uh, i realize this because again you may get confused between vr and vr okay so this is the relative velocity so this is actually how we apply the uh, guess okay so let's solve one problem to uh, to apply this equation onto the case okay so let's see this is the sprinkler 
the three arm lawn sprinkler so this is a lawn sprinkler actually so this has three arms okay so first arm second, maybe you call this one two and third arms first arm second arm and also this is the third arm actually now shown receives 20 degrees celsius water so basically 20 is like room temperature conditions so density is 1000 kg per meter cube to the center at 2.7 meter cube per hour so what is the discharge total discharge actually so total discharge which is entering this sprinkler q 2.7 meter cube per hour actually which is 2.7 by 3600 meter cube per second okay so this is per second now if this is q then definitely q by 3 passes through each of the sprinkler so this is q by 3 this is q by 3 because it's the 3 arm sprinkler so when q discharge is entering total it is q third is what which flows to each of the slots again here okay so this is, is the slots now let's see when this fluid is coming out like this so let's say if this fluid is coming out like this okay so this fluid is actually coming out like this when this fluid is coming out like this because of this fluid can because of this outlet can anyone tell me and because of the outlet here outlet here the reaction forces are in opposite direction so because of these outlets can anyone tell me what would be the direction of this rotation of this sprinkler clockwise or anti-clockwise see fluid jet is leaving so it has some reaction in the other direction Re leaving reaction in the direction Re leaving reaction in this direction so can anyone tell me the rotation of this sprinkler is in which direction clockwise or anti-clockwise clockwise or anti-clockwise it should be clockwise actually okay so the reaction is of course clockwise clear so this reaction is clockwise the reason is you see so some faculty says v has to be absolute velocity in this equation now v has to be the relative velocity in this equation clear because see whatever the equation you derive for rtd that is only when we assume the control volume is actually fixed okay if control volume is not fixed then definitely you have to uh, take relative velocities okay because we are writing all the equations in the reference frame of the control volume clear every equation that i'm framing is basically in the reference frame of the control volume okay like for example you see like let's say you see here for example if i fix a plate okay so if i fix a plate actually here if i fix a plate then if i adjust a control volume like this and let's say fluid is coming with velocity v this fellow is moving with velocity u of course you know in this case the formula comes out to be rho a v minus u whole square this is what you write okay you all know this now you all know this formula rho a v minus u whole square the fluid actually goes like this okay when it's so you you know this right normally for this system this is the formula sigma f if i calculate acting on the plate this is what i'll get yes or no correct now how this formula is coming because when you are sitting on the control frame when you are sitting on this control reference, control volume, what you observe is the x component of velocity, which is coming. See, normally you are supposed to write sigma fx is equal to m dot vr x at outlet minus m dot vr x at inlet. Okay, and clearly at outlet, you see there is no at outlet there is nothing in the x component direction because fluid purely leaves in the y direction. Okay, but at the inlet, you try to understand this. At the inlet, this value without writing v minus u how you are getting this formula understood without writing v minus u without writing the relative velocity in this x component how we are getting a square for v minus u got it so all these equations are basically with respect to the control volume reference okay if you sit here you will feel the fluid is coming inside at this value of v minus u of course okay so same is the story basically absolute is only the case when the control volume is fixed okay even if control volume is fixed this u is zero and even we we'll get oav square okay no issues okay so let's see so this sprinkler rotates in the clockwise direction okay now when this sprinkler rotates in the clockwise direction about this point let's see when the sprinkler is rotating clearly this is v component of velocity but only tangential components are responsible so this is if this velocity is v this is v cos theta but 
at the same time because of this ads this also have certain velocity which is r times omega omega is the radius of the sprinkler and this is the capital r so every point on the periphery of the sprinkler for example if you neglect this small length okay this length is very small for example this length is very uh, small okay let's say fluid just this is just for the turning of the flow that's it okay similarly here this is v cos theta tangential component is only responsible and the radial component passes through the radius again okay similarly here also you'll see sorry you see this is your v cos theta actually okay and at every point on the periphery of the wheel at at this point it has a velocity r omega at this point because sprinkler is rotating clockwise this has a velocity r omega and this has a velocity which is r omega like this in this direction r omega clear so if you apply this equation to the sprinkler let's see let us give the value theta this is actually an unsolved question from frank m white okay so normally if you have frank m white uh, one of the extraordinary textbooks for even I strongly recommend you to mo to tomorrow and today if you have some time you can solve questions unsolved questions not all questions but some questions from chapter numbers uh, 3 and 4 of this book okay yeah because first is general introduction second is hydrostatics yeah third differential and inter integral analysis of control volumes and uh, four is differential analysis of fluid systems from these three four chapters if you do some questions there's high probability that some of them can come in exam okay so anyway let's see so this is Frank M, uh, an unsolved question from Frank M White. So this is Q, 2.7 meter cube per hour, which is 2.7 by 3600 meter cube per second. We are seeing velocity by sitting on top of the nozzle. Yes, because all these equations are written based on the control volume reference. Okay, we are sitting on the control volume and then observing the velocities. Clear? As your velocity components don't, it's okay. You can uh, get a copy, maybe if possible. So as your velocity component, then the sprinkler will rotate anticlockwise. Look, I'll tell you, if this fluid is leaving in this direction, then the reaction force acting on the sprinkler will be in this direction. Yes or no? The reaction force acting on the sprinkler will be in this direction. Okay. Similarly, if fluid is leaving in this, the reaction force will in, in, that, in this direction. If fluid is leaving like this, reaction force will be in this direction. So these three reaction forces, A, B, and C, these reaction forces will actually evolve the sprinkler in the clockwise direction. Okay. Got it? Because the rotation of the body is as per the rotation uh, is as per the torque applied on the sprinkler itself. Got it? Rocky, understand one thing. Like for example, you see, when you fire a bullet, the force acting on the bullet is basically in the positive direction because outlet is at high speed, inlet speed is zero. So, for example, if you take this gun, okay, I'm very bad at drawing the things, but let's say I'm trying to draw one gun, okay. Okay, so let's say this is a gun. Whenever you take a gun like this, then if you have a bullet, for example, here, then initially the velocity of this bullet is zero. So if you take the control volume, for example, so if you take this as the control surface, sigma fx acting on bullet is equal to m dot v at outlet minus m dot v at inlet okay so m dot v at inlet now let's see this is anyhow zero because at the inlet it, it the fluid is not uh, this uh, is not cutting any control surface but when it crosses the control surface this value is v so you have m dot v let's say for example this m dot i'm writing test dm by dt okay so at the outlet what is the momentum it's leaving the control surface okay so it has got some momentum now let's see because of this this is a positive quantity because v2 is actually positive so because of this this force acting on the bullet is positive okay so the force acting on the bullet is in x direction so as a reaction the force acting on the gun will be in the reverse direction so that the gun actually comes back okay similarly when the fluid is leaving in this direction the reactions act in these directions and they produce the rotation of the sprinkler in the clockwise clear q equal to 7.5 meter cube per second let's see 2.7 is given now 2.7 meter cube per hour so 2.7 by 3600 anyway let's see okay so i hope this idea is clear yeah it's good to ask these questions at this point okay uh, i actually modeled <laughs> modeled a water gun fine okay but yeah it's always good to ask these questions because when you are applying rtts many people have these doubts of why to put velocities as negative why put velocities as positive or taking the details of velocities okay uh, magnitudes uh, like some of you have questioned me why relative velocity these kind of questions are a bit important okay yeah fine 
So I'll erase the unnecessary parts here, which are not much detailed. Uh, omega. Similarly, you need not have this here, and you need not have this here. Fine. Okay. So let's see if you have this. Then at any point on the control surface, like for example, you analyze one point. Okay. You see, sigma torque acting on sprinkler. Sprinkler, sigma torque acting on sprinkler. It's steady state rotation. Okay. Steady rotation. Right. Okay. In RPM. So the three arm lawn sprinkler shows receives 20 degrees Celsius water to the center at 2.7 meter cube per hour. If the color friction is neglected, the steady state rotation is dashed. Okay. So sigma t acting on the sprinkler is equal to sigma m dot v relative into r at outlet minus sigma m dot v relative into r at inlet. Now if you take this control volume, the sprinkler, Basically, fluid is going into the control volume only at one point, which is actually at the center. Okay, so only through the center, the fluid is actually entering into the sprinkler. At the center, if the fluid is entering the sprinkler through the center, what could be the radius of the arm? Let's say, for example, if momentum is, for example, if this has some momentum, okay, if this mass is moving with some, then the momentum vector will be along the velocity vector. Okay, so if the velo velocity is through the center, then what would be radius, radial arm of rotation at this center? Zero. Correct. So this quantity is zero. And there's only one inlet, so that's zero. Now coming to here, sigma t on sprinkler. So tell me one thing. If there is some net torque on the sprinkler, then will the sprinkler accelerate or not? Yes or no? Like for example, if you take the e equilibrium for sprinkler, sigma t, sorry, this is on fluid. Okay, this is on fluid. On fluid, yeah. Now let's see. If you have sigma t on sprinkler, some torque is acting on the sprinkler then definitely there would be some i into alpha, yes or no? Because sprinkler is a rigid body and it's rotating about this axis. If there is a net torque acting on the sprinkler, then definitely sprinkler accelerates. But here it is given steady rotation rate, okay? So what is the meaning of steady rotation rate actually? So that means this net torque acting on the sprinkler is also zero, yes or no? Correct, because this alpha has to be zero. If alpha has to be zero, then definitely net torque acting on the sprinkler has also to be zero, clear? Yes or no? So please type in the chat box. Did you understand this point? Did you understand the meaning of steady rotation rate? If net torque is acting on the sprinkler, then definitely the sprinkler will accelerate. But that should not happen. So sprinkler should rotate at steady RPM. So that means net torque acting on the sprinkler is just sufficient to work on the color friction. That's it. Okay. It's not anything which is further accelerating the sprinkler. Now let's see. So if this is zero, then definitely sigma t on sprinkler is equal to minus sigma t on fluid. So this is also zero because of this. Okay, because of this, this sigma t acting on fluid is also zero because both are just having a minus sign. Okay, now let's see, m dot v r out summation has to be zero. What is that? Let's see. Summation m dot v relative into r at outlet is equal to zero. Now let's see, this is outlet number one, two, and three for example. Okay, so let's say this is one. Let's go in an order. Two, and let's say this is three for example. Okay, now at three locations, it is, is it achieving a uniform circular motion, sir? Yeah, basically it's uh, having a constant rotation speed. Okay, so let's see. In this case, now, let's say these are the outlets at this point. Okay, so these are the outlets, one, two, and three, means this is the location where the fluid is cutting the control surface, similarly here and also here, actually. Okay, so if these are the three locations where it's cutting the control surface, then tangential directions, because you know, sigma v r into r for the torque, only the theta component. So sigma v theta relative is actually responsible. So what is the theta relative component? Let's see. Since this conditions, this arm sprinkler is uh, you know symmetric, I would just write three times of m dot v r into r at location one is equal to zero. Okay, because you know one, two, three, all are con all conditions are symmetric; they are identical. So let's see what is m dot to each arm. So to this first arm. The mass flow rate which is flowing out is because its discharge is q by 3. So rho times q by 3 is what you have as the discharge here into v theta relative. So what is v theta relative? We know v theta relative is equal to because of the flow it has some tangential component which is equal to discharge passing through that arm divided by discharge passing through that arm into area of the jet. Okay. Like for example, if you want to know what is this velocity v for example. Okay. 
If this velocity v has to be known, then this discharge divided by this area of cross section gives me this velocity. Okay, this velocity is not because of the arm rotation. This velocity is because of continuity. Because if some fluid is flowing, then definitely because of this fluid flow, your v has to be some quantity actually. Okay, so this v is given by. Let's put only v. V is given by q by t into a. Now the tangential component is actually v theta is equal to q by t by a of course q by t a into you see this is the v which is oriented like this the tangential component of this is v cos theta in this direction okay so v into cos theta of course so this is cos theta so q by t a cos theta sorry your last two lectures are enough sir basically if you uh, practice thoroughly then you can get majority 10 to 11 marks easily from that lectures okay so let's see v theta is equal to q by t a cos theta so v r is equal to q by 3a cos theta then try to understand this fluid is trying to live in this direction but sprinkler is rotating in this direction so these two are in opposite directions therefore minus r omega is what you have into this radial distance which is r is equal to 0 okay so see carefully this m dot is this v relative at this point is this expression because this is the tangential component of velocity because of the fluid flow but r omega the rotation of the sprinkler is in the opposite direction i've told you when you know bodies are moving together i mean when bodies are moving in the same direction we take velocity relative velocity as difference and when they are moving close we take it as positive only and only if the bodies are separated okay if bodies are in contact with each other the relative velocity is sum of the velocities and uh, you know basically if they are moving in the opposite direction and in contact then the relative velocity is defense of the velocities like as i always tell you let's say for example if i'm walking on an escalator okay let's say i want to use the first floor and if i am on the escalator and if i start walking on the escalator then definitely i'll be able to reach the top very fast okay because a relative velocity because me and the escalator are in contact with each other and the relative is just escalator velocity plus my velocity actually here clear so when bodies are in contact and if they're moving in the same direction the relative is in the same direction but if they are in contact and not moving in the same direction then it's difference here you see clearly they are not moving in the same direction this fluid has the tangential direction in this in this direction actually but this has r omega in this direction clear see it's very easy nothing complicated this is v cos theta okay the fluid is trying to come out but this rotation of the arm because this fluid is inside this arm so whenever this arm is rotating in the direction of r omega like this then the relative is nothing but the difference between these two v cos theta minus r omega that's all clear see visualize visualize the sprinkler having three outlets okay that's it clear so v cos theta minus r omega is something like this got it v cos theta is the tangential component at this point because of the flow velocity but this r omega is because of the movement of the arm sprinkler so v cos theta minus r omega is what you have so this quantity is equal to zero so clearly you can understand this r and this q by the a they can be cancelled because right hand side it is zero so you can send them here what we need we need the steady state rotation rate in evolutions per minute okay so let's see omega is equal to omega is equal to q cos theta by t a r is what you have here okay but if you want this in evolutions per uh, minute okay we, we need this in rpm so omega is equal to 2 pi n by 60 n by 60 is equal to q cos theta by t into area flow area is nothing but if this diameter is d pi by 4 d square so pi by 4 small d square is the flow area into the radius r of the arms actually okay so n is in rpm of course so n is in because this omega is in radians per second so this is uh, rpm so we want rpm so n value is equal to 60 can cancel this 20 times and 2 can cancel this 10 times of course so n is equal to so 10 goes on to the top this 4 also goes on to the top so 40 q by 40 q divided by this pi also comes here so pi square d square r times cos theta that's it okay so we have this particular expression here in this case okay so n is equal to 40 q divided by pi square d square into r into cos theta of course okay so let's see if you have the values you can substitute n is equal to 40 into q so what is q meter q per second 
so 2.7 divided by 3600 2.7 divided by 3600 into cos 40 divided by okay into cos 40 divided by pi square d square what is the diameter of each uh, section 7 mm so 0 0.007 square into then this capital R. so what is our 15 centimeters i guess they have given 15 centimeters so this is 0 0.15 meters actually okay so if you simplify this then you can get this value of n in rpm clear you'll get the value of n in rpm okay so that's the value of n in rpm clear so it's a very simple question actually if you can see the only thing is lot of concept lies in this question okay so you to understand and write the relative velocity correctly at each arm is the main thing okay so that's all you see otherwise it's a hardly one two three steps or four maybe if anyhow if you know this then these are four steps four to five steps that's it okay it involves like calculation so anyway let's solve this let's see we can do some simplifications this is 90 then this is uh, you know 27 actually so 0 0.03 fine this is 0 0.03 of course correct because 9 by 29 2.7 is 0 0.3 so one more zero so anyway let's use calculator 0 0.03 into cos 40 so degrees cos 40 0.229 divided by pi square divided by pi square this value uh, divided by again 0 0.15 0 0.15 this value divided by 0 0.007 square double zero seven square actually okay so 316.8 rpm so this value of rotation is 316.8 rpm which is roughly 317 rpm 317 rpm is the rotational speed of this sprinkler actually okay means roughly five rotations per second yeah 316.8 is the correct answer okay this is actually an unsolved question from frank and white of course yeah i'm explaining you see basically when body sign contact okay if body sign contact and if they are moving in the same direction then a relative velocity is sum of these two velocities okay like for example if body one and body two if they are in contact with each other and if they are moving together then the relative velocity is sum of these two velocities okay Sim but if they are in moving in opposite direction okay then the relative is normally the difference here if you see in this case of sprinkler fluid is trying to move in this direction tangentially but this sprinkler rotation if this rotation is in this direction then this arm will move in the right direction so these two velocities are in opposite direction but they are in contact with each other so the relative is going to be the difference of those two velocities okay fine got it yeah so this is of course uh, neglecting air drag of course so this rotation is 317 316.8 rpm roughly okay so 316.8 rpm is the correct answer clear so it's a nice question actually fine so let's see basically this is v cos theta minus r omega should be zero actually okay that's it so v cos theta minus r omega should be zero in this case so n is equal to 40 q by pi square d square into r into cos theta so anyway this question i am giving you as homework so please try if you don't get this before friday i'll post the solution in telegram channel you, because it's a nice question you see answer around i think you'll get 4.88 kgs per second okay because actually this question answer was given as 2.86 in frank and white which is wrong okay because even we have solved the first time when i solved i got 4.88 as the answer but in frank and white it's given 2.86 then uh, even we have we have run some simulation we uh, using some software so we got this 4.88 kgs per second as the correct answer okay then later we have the access to the solution manual of frank and white of course so when we went uh, and checked we have seen there's a small calculation mistake they have done in one of the steps so because of which uh, the answer is coming 2.86 but actually 4.88 is correct answer 4.88 or 4.86 roughly okay 4.8 somewhere clear so homework before friday if you are not able to solve then ask in on friday let's say on friday i'll post it solution will be in t dot me slash pw 
as well. Okay, so this is basically the thing. Okay, so is this clear to all of you? Fine. Now, let's see. So this is what we'll do. Okay, so 4.8 k's per seconds. If you do, if you get, it's fine. If you don't get, then you can ask me. Or else, I think I have solved the same question in fast track also. Okay, because it's a nice question. So uh, we have uh, done even in fast track. Okay. You can check there. So let's get into the next topic, which is the exact solutions of Navier-Stokes equations. Okay. So basically, the Navier-Stokes equation is the main momentum equation for the fluid flows. So if you see the equation Navier-Stokes, of course, the modeling for the shear stress is made as this stress tensor is actually modeled as minus p i plus 2 mu epsilon this stress tensor plus or minus mu by 3 gradient of velocity into i okay so this is normally called lambda lambda is equal to minus mu by 3 is what you have so i think 2 mu by 3 lambda is equal to minus 2 mu by 3 or mu by 3 lambda plus uh, you know 2 mu by 3, I guess, yeah, 2 mu by 3, clear? So this is 2 mu by 3, divergence of velocity into i. This, basically, these are called tensors, okay? But as of now, you can just take the tensors as this is identity matrix of order. Three by three. This is a stress tensor. And normally for incompatible flows, this second coefficient of viscosity is zero, okay? Divergence of velocity is zero. For incompressible flows, actually, okay. So for incompressible flows, clear. So for incompressible flows, actually. So what is the significance of retarding torque in this question instead of just torque? Retarding torque is basically C. I'll tell you. Normally, if you have a sprinkler, okay, this sprinkler will be hold on some collar, okay. Normally, if you have seen lawn, uh, lawn sprinklers, normally you have seen collars now in your in machine drawings many times you might have written you, you might have done this so if you have a collar this collar actually holds this sprinkler so when this sprinkler is rotating the friction between the collar and you know sprinkler is, will be at some radius like for example you say axis of rotation is this then sprinkler sprinkler is surrounded by collar now whenever there is some frictional force acting on the sprinkler this frictional force is at some radius from the uh, uh, axis of the sprinkler okay so because of which you have some torque which tries to slow down the sprinkler that's called the retarding torque okay just for this analysis purpose you take the magnitudes and solve it's okay okay you can just take the magnitude and you can solve it's fine clear so coming to the equation Navier-Stokes equation we have this Navier-Stokes equation as rho x bar normally the body force yeah, actually if you see the equation is given by divergence of the stress tensor plus rho x bar is equal to rho into dv by dt. Okay, so normally you have divergence of tensors, but anyway, just if you write it in the vector form, divergence of vector divergence of tensor gives you a vector. This equation is something like gradient of p minus gradient of p because there is a minus sign here plus mu times del square Laplacian on the velocity vector plus rho x bar is equal to rho times d v by d t. Okay, so this is the vector actually here in this case. That's that equation is basically the vector form. Okay, and if you want, you can split in Cartesian or polar or spherical, of course. So let us see if you split in Cartesian how we get this. Okay, so if you split this in Cartesian, if you split this in Cartesian, then minus dou p by dou x plus mu into Laplacian of u x component of velocity plus density into body force per unit mass actually so rho xx is equal to rho times of du by dt which is acceleration in x direction u into dou u by dou x plus v into dou u by dou y plus w times dou by dou z actually here okay uh, fine 
ధన్యవాదాలు గురించి థ్యాంక్ యూ థ్యాంక్స్ తవన్ యా ఎనివే సో యా దిస్ ఇస్ ద నేవియర్ స్టాక్ సిక్వెషన్ బేసికల్ ఇన్ ద ఎక్స్ డైరెక్షన్ ఓకే సో దిస్ ఈస్ ఇన్ ద ఎక్స్ డైరెక్షన్ సిమిలర్ ఇన్ ద వై డైరెక్షన్ యూ హ్ టు రీప్లేస్ దిస్ యూస్ విత్ వి అండ్ దిస్ ఎక్స్ సబ్స్క్రిప్ట్ విత్ వై అండ్ సిమిలర్లీ ఇన్ జెడ్ డైరెక్షన్ యూ హ్యావ్ ఫర్ జెడ్ డైరెక్షన్ now basically if you solve these equations you actually this equation cannot be solved because of non linearity okay so if you see this not navier stokes equation this is second order because if you see clearly there are second order derivatives in this okay and non linear this equation is also non linear why it's non linear because you see there is product of dependent variable and its derivative so you have terms like this so this acceleration guys gives you non linearity and this laplacian introduces the second order uh, thing in the differential equation okay so it's a second order non linear partial differential equation partial differential equation pde of course so to practically solve this there is no direct classical procedure okay of course you can go with some numerical methods but starting straight away with analytical method you don't have a formula like to solve this equation directly here okay like let's see if you can apply this to some simple solutions we can actually have the uh solutions okay for simple for simple flows if you apply this equation like the first one is quiet flow quiet flow okay so this is called the quiet flow actually so quiet flow is basically flow between a fixed plate and a moving plate the fixed and a moving plate okay so let's see so this is moving at u infinity okay so this is moving at u infinity clear so this is moving at u infinity and so if you define a coordinate system like this to analyze this flow r is an x y and maybe the z direction out of the board so you can take z as this so this is the z direction so the particles are assumed to be moving only along this direction okay so particles have 1d motion along the x di x direction do you use open form for your sometimes i use open form otherwise generally matlab and answers could be fine okay codes will use own okay so normally if you see for generating uh, some uh, you know calculations and doing some analysis we write in c++ or you know python sometimes okay but uh, normally if you have the already existing model and if you have to write you know if you have to analyze certain big structures we use open form of answers okay just a minute guys i'll have water and come okay so let's see so one thing that you know is if you have velocity this velocity changes with y okay so u is a function of y okay so the boundary conditions are you have the equation basically the navier stokes equation so if you have the boundary conditions like if you define the coordinate system like this at y is equal to 0 velocity of the layer is also 0 okay and at y is equal to h because of no slip condition let's say if this gap is h for example if this gap is h the thickness between the plates is h okay then definitely your u is equal to u infinity because the plate the fluid which is in contact with the top plate should also move in the u infinity velocity because you can see it because of no slip conditions okay because of no slip conditions okay because of no slip conditions so you are going to cover cases of quiet flow sir yeah just a minute i won't derive the equation but i'll just show okay so see here if you solve this equation normally in this uh, in the x y and z directions if you solve you will end up with the velocity profile on solving i am giving the velocity profile so please try to do this normally in fast track i have derived this okay in fast track i have derived this but anyway right now i'm just giving the formula your u by u infinity at any location y is given by y by h 
plus alpha times of y by h into 1 minus y by h. This is actually the profile. Clear? So this is the velocity profile. It's a non-dimensionalized form because you see every term it's non-dimensionalized. This alpha is called, which is here, is called h square is basically is equal to h square by 2 mu u infinity into minus dp by dx actually and this is something called dimensionless pressure gradient. Dimensionless pressure gradient. Okay, so this alpha is actually the thing which decides the type of flow that happens here. Okay, so alpha is equal to h square by 2 mu infinity into minus dp by dx, and this is the velocity profile. Why in any flow your main interest is on velocity profiles? Okay, you take any flow, of course, in our this fluid mechanics course, if you see four things which we don't know are if v is equal to ui plus vj plus wk. We don't know what are the functions for this velocity u, v and w components. Or basically this v has three unknowns in this. Three unknowns. And also we don't know something to talk about pressure. Okay. So what is the function of pressure? This we don't know. So three unknowns plus one which is pressure. So totally have four unknowns to solve. Okay. So for these four unknowns, so can we get that PDF of derivations you just showed for reference? Uh, one minute, if I have, I'll show you here itself because uh, recently one of the paid batches I'm taking. So, no, this is just a thing. Hmm. You see, some questions I have solved basically. So, here you can see Navier Stokes equation I have derived actually here by taking the stress element. Okay. So, then uh, we have formed basically. So this is the divergence of stress tensor basically. So this elements is the divergence and minus pi plus 2 mu epsilon plus lambda times lambda is basically called the second coefficient of viscosity and this lambda is at times equal to minus 2 mu by 3. Okay. So lambda is normally called the second coefficient of viscosity but for incompressible flows this del dot v is equal to 0 and this lambda value you see normally this is some initial notation which we call so lambda is minus 2 third mu. I have explained a bit there which is of course uh, right now I'm not going to do because of time constraints but if you finally simplify you will end up with these equations and these equations are called the Navier-Stokes equations okay so you see this is the Navier-Stokes equation so minus del p plus mu del square v plus o x is equal to o to dv by dt which is the acceleration part here and if you ap apply it to a coiled flow uh, what did you ask actually derivations okay so yeah so if you see this is the continuity equation and these are the momentum equations which is Navier-Stokes equations in x, y and z directions basically. So we have four unknowns u, v, w and also p but in this coet flow you have v is equal to 0, w is also 0. So if these two quantities are zeros, v is 0 and w is equal to 0 then once upon simplifying these equations you see v equal continuity and these three equations so total four equations for solving four unknowns u v w and p but of course you know directly v is zero and w is zero because particles are translating along x direction so if you put v equal to zero and w is equal to zero here in this case then so if you start putting v equal to zero w equal to zero this dou e by dou x equal to zero in this this equation gets converted to a ordinary differential equation and you can see this is the differential equation finally to solve. So to solve this differential equation we need two boundary conditions at y equal to 0 your u is 0 at y equal to h u equal to in u infinity. So if you put this differential boundary conditions and if you solve this differential second order differential equation after a bit of solving getting the constant c1 and c2 values okay. So this is c2 and this is c1 so bit of simplification that finally gives you the formula u by u infinity is equal to y by h plus alpha times of y by h into 1 minus y by h which I have actually written here in this case okay and this alpha is called the dimensionless pressure gradient which is this expression clear okay fine right now I'm you know cutting short many things because it's a just a revision class and already in fast track also I have done this okay it's not available in telegram channel but it's actually available in uh, uh, you know app pw app in a free course section okay i'll tell you how to access this doc uh, not this document exactly what i have shown you but in the fast track what i have taught okay that documents uh, you can go to uh, pw app then select the gate mechanical in gate mechanical you have something called free batches in free batches you see fast track okay you have the batch for fast track there you open fluid mechanics you'll get pdfs of all this I mean of the content actually okay not the same pdfs as I told you but the same content I have discussed in fast track so then you can get that pdfs okay.
So, but you can see clearly this is the derivations which we can. Uh, this is a simple math, okay? You can just it's not a weight of thing. You just put in some conditions which you know. So then this equation gets converted to the boundary, the, the differential equations. And if you solve these differential equations, then obviously you have your uh, velocity profile, okay? So once you get your velocity profile, then you can calculate whatever you want. Okay, fine. So anyway, here if you see in case one, case one which is the simple coet flow simple coet flow this flow is purely shear driven flow okay it's purely 100% shear driven flow shear driven flow because pressure gradient actually uh, it depends on alpha and of course one more important thing this flow happens because of the pulling of this uh, plate actually okay so it's like a mixed i would say i won't say it's purely uh, shear but uh, mixed kind of thing okay pressure plus this uh, shear at the top wall because of the no slip will also guide the flow actually so it's a combination of pressure driven plus shear driven so simple coet flow is the case of when alpha is equal to zero okay so this implies minus dp by dx is equal to zero which is no pressure gradient in that case okay because of this case only i have told pure shear so this is pressure gradient is zero pressure gradient is zero actually in this case okay so pressure gradient is zero which means pressure is uniform at all the points so the flow is actually purely shear driven okay in this case the flow is purely due to the motion of the plate which is shear driven so this velocity profile in this case i would like to draw in the next page u infinity so if you take the y axis somewhere here this is y axis and this is x axis yeah okay so this is x axis then the velocity profile here if you see this velocity profile is linear for alpha is equal to 0 okay so for this alpha is equal to 0 then this velocity profile is linear means if you take the velocities at different sections the velocities are linear in nature this is for alpha is equal to zero now if alpha is positive you will end up with something which is like when alpha is greater than zero i will show here better okay so you'll see this is the case one when uh, you know it's a linear velocity profile when this is zero actually okay now when alpha greater than one you can see you will have a maximum velocity where this maximum velocity okay so you'll see this maximum velocity is u infinity into alpha plus one whole square by four alpha of course okay so you will understand there comes a velocity which is more than this u infinity so this is how let's say for example if alpha is equal to two maybe here okay alpha is equal to three if you keep alpha is equal to three could be something like this alpha is equal to 3 could be something like this actually this point comes slightly down but anyway just it's a rough sketch so alpha is equal to 3 so as you keep increasing alpha basically this quantity if you keep increasing the alpha this value deviates more from 1 actually it's simple differentiation for maximum velocity du by dy equal to 0 i have sorted the y location and if alpha is increasing then definitely this value comes down so obviously this point at of maximum velocity will be at lower uh, height as compared to this height okay like for example if this is the location of maximum velocity here this is the location of maximum velocity so this height decreases as you keep increasing the alpha but u maximum keeps increasing okay but because of its shear driven plus pressure driven in this case so the fluid goes because of the pressure gradient up to this level but again because of the shear at this layers it comes back and it reaches in equilibrium with this point actually okay and when alphas are negatives you'll see the flow is something like this okay so some part of the fluid gets uh, reversed actually here minus three for example so alpha is equal to minus three so at this location so these are different velocity profiles for different values of alpha actually okay so various velocity pro velocity profiles velocity profiles for various values of alpha clear so these are the velocity profiles for various values of alpha in this case and 
you can understand there's one specialty for alpha equal to minus 3 actually okay uh, sorry in single slit diffraction with width equal to 0.1 wavelength a convex length of focal length 20 mm is used to find width of central maxima sorry i don't have much of idea in optics to be honest as of now uh, okay so better you can contact someone else manish fine because double slit experiments we have seen some long time back but single slit i think i have not uh, seen in recent times at least okay that too with convex lens clear so let's see uh, yeah here if you have this velocity profiles this alpha is equal to 3 so what does this alpha equal to the speciality okay so at alpha is equal to minus 3 discharge across the cross section net q q net let us say q net across the section is equal to 0 of course because at any section if you want discharge use what you'll do 0 to h u into or uh, u infinity or u basically u times dy into w okay so this is what you have where w is the width of the plates width of the plates actually here in this case okay so this is width of the plates so if w is the width of the plates then let's see if you want to calculate discharge this discharge q is something like okay so discharge q is something like mu u infinity h per unit width okay so into w mu u infinity h into w or u mu will not be there i guess so u infinity into h into w into 1 by 2 plus alpha by 6 this is what you'll get as the expression for discharge i think uh, maybe in the next lecture i have done this let i'll show you yeah so let's see fine so if you can see here yeah discharge so this expression for discharge u infinity into so this integration is what you have to do actually so u into dy into w so it's a simple bit of math integration so if you do you will get this as the discharge which is happening at a particular cross section so if this is the discharge which is happening at cross section okay so if this is the discharge then for q is equal to 0 then your alpha is equal to minus 3 of course okay when alpha equal to minus 3 this becomes minus 1 by 2 and this term becomes 0 actually okay so for alpha equal to minus 3 the net discharge at the cross section because some part of the flow takes place in this direction there's a flow reversal because of the adverse pressure gradient alpha negative means dp by dx is positive okay this high pressure on upstream direction will throw the fluid this side but at some point you have a compromise and some flow will happen in the right side direction okay so therefore the net flow at any cross section is zero so therefore alpha is equal to minus 3 is equal to h square by 2 mu u infinity into minus dp by dx so the pressure gradient in the flow for zero flow is equal to 6 mu u infinity by h square okay so this is the actual case the pressure gradient for the flow to be zero at this particular constant okay. so all those expressions do we have to remember no only one expression if you can remember only this velocity profile this part clear so only this part you have to have some idea if you have some idea then everything you can calculate okay for quiet flow plane poisley and Huygen poisley we have you know fl uh, flow through pipes so for plane poisley and quiet flows and also thin film flow if you have then we uh, you should actually remember this expression okay so if you can remember this then shear stress is mu into du by dy you can calculate discharge integral 0 to h u dy you can calculate again okay so this is the velocity profile which actually comes out okay now coming to the plane poisley flow Plane Poiseley flow between two fixed plates. Flow between two fixed plates. Okay. So if you have this two fixed plates in this case, So let's say these two are fixed plates okay 
when these two are fixed because of symmetry we take the coordinate system generally somewhere here because it's easy for us to analyze if you take the coordinate system in the middle okay so you take the coordinate system here then here you have x x y and z directions okay so this is x y and z so here so alpha negative means adverse pressure gradient yes of course a dp by dx has to be positive okay so but in actual case normal pressure in the direction of flow normally because of friction or things related pressure actually decays but in this case this uh, dp by dx is actually positive in this case okay because of this alpha being negative you see this is a positive value clear so this is adverse pressure gradient if you want i'll write adverse pressure gradient actually okay so now here if you see flow between two fixed plates the velocity at any point like at any given value of y if you calculate this velocity u is equal to h square by 2 mu minus dp by dx into 1 minus y square by h square this is the expression for velocity actually okay so this gives you the expression for velocity in the case of plane Poiseuille flows, of course. Okay. So h square by 2 mu minus dp by dx into 1 minus y square by h square. This again, you can see, basically I have derived have this here. I'll show you. This is a case of alpha equal to minus t. I was explaining. Okay. So this 0. Then after, huh, here this is a plane Poiseuille flow. Okay. Basically, flow between two fixed plates. You see I have fixed these two plates. Then again, fluid particle move only in the y direction. So we have applied continuity and momentum equations again. So basically why we are neglecting gravity because these flows are not gravity driven flows okay so it's not it's purely pressure this is in this case it's purely pressure driven flow in the previous case it's due to shear and also pressure driven flows does this general equation holds when we are when the plates are moving not exactly these equations the only thing that happens there is this boundary conditions here at y let's say for example plates are moving okay if plates are moving instead of u equal to zero here we'll put some constant so accordingly this c1 c2 values will change and equation will be something different okay not exactly the same equations clear if plates are moving let's say for example if this is some uh, you know u infinity 1 and this is u infinity 2 then this constant c2 and c1 will have different values in that case okay till here the forces are same but this boundary conditions will change because the fluid which is in contact with the plate will move at the same speed okay got it done okay so let's see so we got this uh, c1 and c2 constants because of this differential equation then you will see this is the equation basically you see h u is equal to h square by 2 mu minus dp by dx into 1 minus y square by h square actually here okay so the same expression which you have h square by 2 mu into minus dp by dx into 1 minus y square by h square so clearly this is parabolic so in this case this velocity profile at any section if you take the velocity profile then this is parabolic okay so this is parabolic clear and here you can understand one thing if you see maximum velocity u maximum is equal to so u maximum is equal to this happens at the center line y equal to 0 h square by 2 mu into minus dp by dx and from the discharge if you calculate discharge value q will come out as 2h for example if this is h and this gap is again h so normally this is y is equal to plus h and this is y is equal to minus h okay so this is y is equal to minus h in this case so 2h times width of the plate into you will get the velocity as 2 third h square by mu okay or h square by 3 mu h square okay so h square by 3 mu actually okay so h square by 3 mu into minus dp by dx this is the discharge actually here that you get in this case okay so yeah because average velocity in this case is u average by u maximum if you calculate this ratio average by maximum is actually equal to average by maximum is equal to 2 third in this case okay so this value is 2 by 3 okay so average velocity to the maximum velocity is 
do that. So obviously, the flow at any section is the flow area, which is 2h into w into average velocity. So if you write two thirds of this value, two two gets cancelled. So this is the average velocity at any section. So that's how we get the discharge. Okay. So this relation is again very important. And if you observe the shear stress at this point, shear stress actually is equal to. So what is the shear stress value? Mu into dou u by dou y. It's not wall. Normally shear stress is equal to mu into du by dy. U depends only on y, of course. So mu into if you differentiate this with respect to y partially, you have h square by 2 mu minus dp by dx into minus 2h by h square actually. Okay. So you can simplify certain things. Mu, mu, h square, h square, 2 and 2 gets cancelled. So minus, this is 2y, okay, not 2h, sorry, 2y of course. So this is 2y. So you have minus dp by dx minus dp by dx into y actually here. Okay. So clearly if you see the velocity shear stress profile, the shear stress profile at any section will be linear profile. This is parabolic. Okay. So this expression is parabolic velocity. And you can see, yeah. Clear? So this is the velocity profile. Okay. And if you want wall shear stress, if you want this wall shear stress, this wall is at a distance of y equal to minus h or maybe y equal to plus h. So if you keep h into dp by dx is the magnitude of the shear stress actually there in that case. Okay. So these are the main salient points. Basically, if you have the velocity profile, you can get whatever you want. You can calculate average velocity. Okay. You can calculate shear stress. You can calculate discharge. You can calculate skin friction coefficient, which is Cf is equal to wall shear stress magnitude divided by rho you half rho infinity square okay so this is basically the shear stress uh, skin friction coefficient okay so skin friction coefficient cf is the skin friction skin friction coefficient okay skin friction coefficient clear so these are the things in a nutshell basically and if you go to one last thing which is of course, flow through pipes we have already seen, right? Huygens Poisley flow. Flow through pipes you might have seen in mechanical, you might have seen a lot of things. Okay? So, normally if you see flow through pipes, the velocity profile is again parabolic and this is symmetric about the radius. Okay? This part comes here, so it's a K shaped thing. No need, no? Because potential flow, uh, sorry, in, uh, you know, flow through pipes you might have seen plenty of times by now. Okay? Losses, Darcy Wishback formulas, all these things, you know, I think many of you are comfortable. Moody's chart. Okay? I'll open the syllabus, you can understand. So maybe if I open the syllabus. So anyway, here you have the document. If you want, I'll go with a quick go through the things. So you can see, so this is basically the showing up two by three, how that two by three is coming basically by, uh, you know, uh, calculating, then calculating pressure loss between uh, length L. Okay. Then thin film flows is this basically, which I thought of doing now. But anyway, you can see this is the thin film flows, the velocity profile and all comes like this. And if you go for Hagen Poiseuille flow, so basically in a flow through a pipe, symmetric, okay. So these are the Navier Stokes in polar coordinates, okay. So if these are the Navier Stokes in polar coordinates, then on solving, you will end up with uh, these boundary conditions and this is the velocity profile. R square by 4 mu minus dp by dz into 1 minus R square by R square, okay. This velocity profile and the velocity profile for plane Poiseuille both are same, okay. So Poiseuille, one is for plane, one is cylindrical, that's it, okay. So instead of R, there we have the spacing, half spacing H, that's it, okay. So but the equations remain same ultimately, clear. So thin film flows, if you see, just if you look at thin film flows, okay. So thin film flows, like for example, if you have this plate and this is inclined at some angle. So this is theta, let's say. So if this is theta and if the fluid is flowing, very thin layer of fluid is actually flowing in this case. Okay. So a very thin layer of fluid is actually flowing in this case. So we can define the coordinate system again. So maybe some point here. So this is the y direction which is perpendicular to this. So this is y. Then this is x of course in this direction. This is x. Okay, and z is actually perpendicular. Okay, now clearly you'll see in this case it's not pressure driven; it's purely gravity driven. Okay, 
equations so all those equations are independent of type of flow type of fluid actually because we are taking mu is constant okay but uh, type of flow what do you mean by type of flow like uh, do you mean inviscid viscous if, if things are not viscous then there is no velocity profile first of all okay things has to be viscous we have taken density out as constant so it's incompressible flow okay laminar and turbulent no basically here if you see in case of turbulence this equation of course these equations are valid but not in a complete way we don't take u as a single component there okay we take u as u bar plus fluctuating component of velocity okay so dealing with this fluctuation components is not easy that's why even till today 90 percent of the turbulent flows is not solved it okay because the fluctuating components are time dependent and you know we cannot use the uh, uh, navier stokes equations as it is to solve this turbulent flows clear that's what got it like when i when, I, when i'm deriving those equations i told you the particle moves only along x direction but in turbulence that's not the case the particle can move in any direction so randomly okay so that's why clear so let's see in this case it's not pressure driven because pressure is uniform at all points okay p is constant at all points which you can see from the navier stokes equation again at all points in the flow so at all points in the flow so again from the navier stokes equations i would like to show you uh, just before this i'll show you so see here this is a thin film flow for example so if you try to analyze this flow momentum equation and x y z directions okay here you cannot neglect body forces because gravity is the flow which is uh, pulling but pressure is uniform at all the cases okay anyhow dou pivot of it is zero but since this gravity is not acting anything in the y direction it's only acting along the x direction responsible for driving the flow only along x direction we take the body force in the x direction as rg cos theta because if gravity is acting down then this component is actually g sin theta of course so this is not impacting the flow so we take this zero dou p by dou y is zero and by simple understandings you will understand dou p by dou x is also zero so p is actually constant at all the points in the flow and if you take the velocity profile it becomes parabolic okay so i'll just show you yeah this is a parabolic velocity profile so here in this case if you calculate u your u will be rho g sin theta by mu into h y minus y square by 2 this is the actual profile in this case h is the thickness of this film actually okay so h is the thickness of this film here so this is u of course in this case clear so that's what even i, I would have got here yeah this is the case so once you get the velocity profile then you can direct all these things okay discharge shear stress what all you want you can see see basically whatever might be the flow exact solutions of navier stokes equation once you have the navier stokes equation just try to put in the correct terminology you will get the answers okay so this is the basically velocity profile for this and if you want shear stress then tau is equal to mu into du by dy mu og sin theta by mu you see there is no pressure here because pressure nothing uh, drives the flow here so it's not pressure driven flow is gravity driven flow body force driven flow actually okay so it's body force driven flow so mu og sin theta by mu into du by dy so if you differentiate this h minus y of course here okay so that's all you have h minus uh, this differentiation is 2 by 2 2 gets cancelled mu mu gets cancelled so this is a linear shear stress variation into h minus y so the maximum shear stress is at y equal to 0 obviously at the wall and the minimum shear stress it is 0 at the free surface okay so here this free surface is shear free is shear free actually okay so this is basically the shear stress and tau max is at wall of course is at wall and wall is at as per this coordinate system we have seen tau max is nothing but tau at y equal to 0 because the wall is located at y equal to 0 so rho g h sin theta that's it okay it depends on theta if theta is 90 this is rho g h directly okay if you have a vertical wall like this then definitely tau w is equal to rho g h because theta value is 90 so sin theta is 1 in that case clear to all so these are the basic types of flows you can see plain poisonly then uh, you know coed flow these are the main uh, this diagram is sometimes very much important okay because it gives you various velocity profiles because it, it coed flow is slightly different from other types of flows okay because in other types of flows for a given pressure gradient and all we have a particular velocity profile but here depending on the variation of pressure gradient then we have certain velocity profiles actually here in this case okay so let's see let us solve some problems 
So let us solve this question. A belt conveyor consists of a flat belt which is 0.6 meters wide, which slides at a velocity 5 meters per parallel to a surface, separated by a 7 centimeters thick layer of oil of viscosity 0.29 pascal second. Magnitude of pressure gradient in the x, x direction for zero shear stress at the top surface of the belt is dash Newton per meter cube. I want to do decimal places, assume it is fully developed laminar flow. So let's see. There is a surface initially and there is a conveyor belt which is also moving okay so normally there is a conveyor belt which is moving like this okay so this gap is there so let me just enlarge this diagram fine so let's see this gap is 7 mm so let's say this is h which is equal to it's at 7 centimeters thick layer so this is 7 centimeters of course okay so 7 centimeters means considerably some thick amount of fluid normally you have the conveyor belt okay so Let's see, this conveyor belt consists of a flat belt 0.6 meters wide. So width of the plate, width of the belt is 0.6 meters, which slides at a velocity of 5 meters per second. So this is sliding at a velocity of 5 meters per second on this viscous oil, okay? Okay, so on this viscous oil. Now, if this is floating on this viscous oil, so if this is 7 centimeters, the viscosity of the oil is given. Let's see, magnitude of the pressure gradient in x direction for zero shear stress on the top surface. Okay, so what is the expression for shear stress? First of all, you know the velocity profile. This is u infinity or u is equal to u infinity times of y by h plus alpha times y by h into 1 minus y by h. Okay, so because you know this surface is fixed. Okay, surface is not moving, so it's a coherent flow clearly this surface is fixed okay then there is oil and the conveyor belt is actually moving just cover the potential flows and last year excavation courses you have done because of time constraint all were too good thanks for all you did done doing thank you yeah so let's see so this is u is equal to u infinity times this and obviously this is a coherent flow because the surface has to be blocked and this velocity profile is in this particular direction 5 meters per second okay so i mean the belt is actually moving in that direction so if you want shear stress mu into du by dy so if you Simplify this mu into u infinity times of 1 by h plus alpha into in dif differentiation of y by h is again 1 by h minus y square by h square, which is 2y by h square actually here. Okay, so this is the velocity profile, uh, sorry, shear stress profile, of course, because if you see mu into du by dy, u infinity is constant, derivative of this with respect to y is 1 by h plus alpha is constant, y by h minus y square by h square. So differentiation of y by h is 1 by h minus differentiation of y square is 2y by h square actually. Okay. Now let's see the magnitude of the pressure gradient in x direction for zero shear stress at the top surface of the belt. So if you see this belt is at h distance. So shear stress acting at the top surface basically at this is y is equal to h. So at y is equal to h of course. So at y is equal to h you want the shear stress to be zero. Okay. So this shear stress has to be zero at y is equal to h obviously okay so if you put y equal to this shear stress is equal to zero and if you put y equal to h here let's see this is anyhow zero this constant if you shift this side it is zero so one by h plus alpha times of one by h minus two h by h square so this is two by h is equal to zero actually okay so this is the expression one by h plus alpha times of one by h minus two by h so h can be cancelled because h is common in denominator so 1 minus 2 is minus 1. So 1 minus alpha is equal to 0. So alpha has to be 1 if the top surface has to be shear free. Yes or no? Do you all understand till this point? Can you all get till this point? Can you all understand till alpha is equal to 1? But at alpha is equal to 1, the shear stress acting on the top layer of the fluid is going to be 0. Is this clear? Yes. So if this is the value of alpha, so alpha is equal to since alpha is equal to h square by 2 mu u infinity into minus dp by dx okay so alpha is equal to 1 actually okay so if alpha is equal to 1 anyhow we need magnitude of pressure gradient okay so you take the modulus on all sides this is anyhow positive so now alpha is equal to 1 so what is the magnitude of pressure gradient for alpha is equal to 1 2 mu u infinity by h square so 2 into mu dynamic viscosity of the oil so dynamic viscosity is 0.29 pascal second 
u infinity. So what is the phase time velocity? At which this blade is pulling five meters per second. So this is five divided by h square. So what is h square actually? So h square h is a point h is seven centimeters thick. Okay. So zero point seven zero point zero seven whole square. This value is going to be in newton per meter cube because pressure is newtons per meter square divided by gradient. Okay. So newton per meter cube. So just calculate this value. 10 into 0 0.29, 2.9 divided by 0 0.07 square, 591.83, 591.83 Pascal per meter. So this is the magnitude of the pressure gradient. Five ninety one point eight three newtons per meter cube is actually the pressure gradient in this flow. Clear? Yeah, 591. 7543 is coming. How come? Unofficial MBB. 2 mu u infinity by h square. This gap is h, it's a covered flow. So gap is 7 centimeters. So 7, 0 0.07 square. I think this could be correct. Yeah. Okay. Because the value of alpha is 1 in this case. Okay. So if alpha is 1, alpha is equal to this quantity. So if you take the magnitude of the pressure gradient, 591.83 Pascal per meter cube is what it's coming. Okay. Clear? 591.8 roughly Pascal's per meter Pascal per meter or Newton per meter cube. Okay. So let's go to one more question, basically. So let's see. Consider a lambda flow in the x direction between two infinite parallel plates. Coet flow. This is a coet flow again. The lower plate is stationary, of course, coiled flow, and upper plate is moving with velocity of 1 cm per second in x direction. The distance between the plates is 5 mm, and dynamic viscosity is this. Shear stress on the lower plate is 0, then pressure gradient, dou p by dx is dash. Will you all solve this question? Basically, if you see, same story, tau is equal to mu u infinity 1 by h plus alpha into 1 by h minus 2y by h square. This is what we have, okay? Now, they are asking you, the shear stress on the bottom plate has to be zero. Okay, so at y is equal to zero, at y is equal to zero because the coordinate system we have taken for analysis is this is u infinity, this is fixed, this is h of course. Okay, so if this is h, then this y equal to zero will make this term zero, and this shear stress is also zero. So you can cancel this. So finally, alpha is equal to minus one. That's it. Okay. So if alpha equal to minus one, then h this dp by dx. Okay. Anyhow, if shear stress is zero, then the pressure gradient dp by dx is equal to dp minus dp by dx is uh, actually alpha is equal to h square by two u infinity minus dp by dx. So this is two mu u infinity by h square. That's it. Okay. So two mu dynamic viscosity would have been given somewhere. So point not one Pascal second. So ten power minus two u infinity this is moving at 1 centimeters per second so 10 power minus 2 meters per second divided by h square so what is h separation between the plates is 5 mm okay so 25 into 10 power minus 6 so this is in newton per meter cube and what are the units they are asking newton per meter square per meter okay that's nothing but newton per meter cube so if you simplify 4 8 is what you have here that's it. Okay. Because this 10 power minus 4 cancels this 10 power minus 2 times. So 10 power minus 2, if you go back, it becomes 10 square. So 100 by 25, 4. So 2 fours are 8. So how will the velocity profile will look for this condition? Alpha equal to minus 1. Na? So if you take something like this here, then at alpha equal to minus 1, your profile looks something like this. Okay. Clear? Because dp by dx is positive, so some part will be in the reverse direction. Got it? Pressure gradient is positive, now, so some part of the fluid will be thrown back because of the adverse pressure gradients. That's it. Okay? So you see, this fluid will actually travel in this direction okay so let's go to the next question yeah i think this potential flow is the last topic so basically we have covered these things today 
So just a minute. First of all, let us uh, see what all we have covered. We have covered non-Newtonian, RTTs, then exact solutions for Navier-Stokes. Then let's go to the last module, which is the potential flows. Okay. Potential flows. Fine. So let's see. Just a minute. Let's have some water before starting it. Have you all got some idea on RTTs? Navier-Stokes equation, okay, and of course the small topic non-Newtonian fluids, okay, because rest of the things are similar in mechanical. What you have done, see things are similar, so we will focus on this potential flows, okay. So let's see, let us solve this potential flow. So someone asked me what is ideal flow, which is nothing but potential flow actually, okay. So potential flows are basically ideal flows, which means they are inviscid and along with being inviscid, we also have incompressible and Irrotational flows. Irrotational flows actually. Okay. So this is irrotational flows. So clearly, this inviscid means there is no viscous effects term in the equation. Incompressible divergence of velocity is equal to zero and irrotational del cross V is equal to zero bar, of course. Okay. So del cos V is equal to zero bar. Now, one important thing I want to tell you, if curl of service topic is having high weightage, it's not like a weightage point of time, but see, as I told you, no, we have 22 questions only from eight, nine chapters, okay, or nine, 10 chapters maximum. So there will be question from every chapter, okay, but normally kinematics and dynamics and this, uh, you know, potential flows also, you have some weightage, some two, three questions come generally. Okay, so let's see. So in this case, you have incompressible and also irrotational flows in this case. So let's see if the flow is irrotational. Okay, if in maths you know there is a statement del cos v is equal to zero. If this happens, then definitely there exists a scalar function phi. such that such that f of v is equal to this velocity is equal to gradient of the phi actually okay so velocity is equal to gradient of the phi either mu or du by dy is equal to zero du by dy need not be zero okay because i'll show you in which it means shear stress is zero viscous effects in the flow are zeros if viscosity is not there then obviously shear uh, you know shear won't be there viscous shear will not be there okay clear Basically, we see the flow is basically inviscid. Inviscid means the contribution due to the viscous terms are very, very less. Okay, that's all. So this V bar is equal to gradient of phi, and this phi in this case is nothing but velocity potential. Velocity potential actually here. Okay, so this is velocity potential. So here I would like to again. Uh, okay, fine. I'll first dare the things, then I'll show you. So this phi is called the velocity potential actually, okay? So if you s simplify this, you know, V bar is equal to, for example, say Ui plus Vj in two dimensions if you are dealing with things, Ui plus Vj. This gradient of phi is like dou phi by dou x i cap plus dou phi by dou y j cap actually, okay? So if you know two vectors are equal, then definitely U is written as dou phi by dou x, it's purely mathematical concept, okay? And practically you cannot see potential lines exactly, okay? These are imaginary lines. So u is equal to dou phi by dou x and v is equal to dou phi by dou y actually, okay? So the part, the phi is defined in such a way that the gradient of phi in any direction gives the velocity of the particles in that direction at that location, okay? Like for example, if you have phi is function of x comma y, then 
do phi by do x will be some function of x comma y. So at that point, the gradient, the change in that function will actually gives you the velocity of the x component. And similarly, this quantity gives you the velocity of the y component, of course. Okay. So if you have lines of constant phi, sorry. If you have these lines of constant phi, like in yesterday's class I was showing, so if these are lines of constant phi, they are parallel, then the lines of constant psi stream functions, which you might have studied, okay, so so if you have the grid like this, okay, this is called the flow net normally. flow net and these are the lines corresponding to psi is equal to c1, c2, c3, c4 and c5 like this. Okay, So psi is equal to this. So basically if you define any complex potential function, so we will see what is a complex potential function but before that I want to tell certain things. See, these angles are at right angles. Okay, So lines of phi equal to constant and psi equal to constant intersect at right angles. Means at this point of intersection at this point of intersection, like for example, you know, equipotential lines are equipotential potential lines are basically the lines where phi is equal to constant. Okay, and stream lines are given by psi is equal to constant. Okay, maybe C1 and C2. So if you take the slope of any point on that curve dy by dx of phi is equal to constant and if you multiply with dy by dx of psi is equal to constant this product comes out to be minus 1 means at the same point means basically the point where they are intersecting the point of intersection at the point of intersection the angle between the two lines is actually 90. You can show this very simply look I told you phi for example phi is a function of x comma y okay if phi is a function of x comma y d phi is equal to dou phi by dou x dx by chain rule okay like in acceleration u8 so this is the chain rule so if you have this as the chain rule now the line phi equal to constant if the line phi is equal to constant then this d phi is equal to 0 because phi is constant so change in phi is 0 so dy by dx if you calculate for this of phi is equal to constant you know we'll end up with this dou phi by dou x is actually u and this dou phi by dou y is actually v. So dy by dx is minus u by v is what you'll get. Okay, so this is minus u by v. But for streamlines, you know the streamline equation. Streamlines are obtained by dx by u is equal to dy by v, of course. Okay, so dy by dx of constant stream function streamline is equal to v by u, of course. Okay, now if you multiply these two guys, you'll observe dy by dx of phi is equal to constant into dy by dx of psi equal to constant is equal to now you see this dy by dx of phi is equal to constant is minus u by v and this guy is v by u clearly okay and these terms cancels and this is minus 1 that's how you have this lines perpendicular to each other okay so they cut orthogonal to each other because of this simple understanding clear to all of you Yes or no? Is this clear to each and everyone? Did you all understand why lines of phi and lines of constant psi cut perpendicular to each other? Yes? Now, let's see one more thing. If you have a vector, for example, okay, you have the Cartesian system. If this is vector, uh, I mean, if this is a coordinate system, for example, so this is horizon x and y okay you take a velocity vector which is passing like this for example to the horizon okay so if this is passing to the horizon then you know if you take the projections so if this vector is given by v bar okay in Cartesian in Cartesian, your velocity vector is given by x component of velocity i cap plus y component of velocity j cap actually. Okay, and if you, for example, so if you see this is u, 
and this is v of course okay if you take the same vector in polar coordinate system for example vector remains same only the coordinates change okay so for example if i want to express this vector in polar coordinate system then it could be something like this maybe okay so it could be something like this here okay fine so it could be something like this where this is the radial component of velocity and this is the azimuthal component of velocity here correct so basically vector remains there okay only for analysis depending on the comfort of your coordinate system the components change okay but the actual velocity vectors will stay as it is okay but the components will actually change depending on the coordinate system what you choose like in polar in polar you'll see this v bar is equal to maybe u r e r cap plus u theta e theta cap actually here okay so u r e r cap plus u theta e theta cap of course so if you see the relation between these components because this is helpful in analyzing the flows okay so in in potential flows so if you see the relation this relation is given by u v is equal to u r u theta times cos theta sin theta minus sin theta cos theta okay so this is what you have actually clear so cos sin minus sin cos theta you can easily show this by just taking the geometry like for example this line can be written as u r or u r or u can be written as this line u can be written as u r cos theta for example if this angle is theta then u r cos theta will be up to this point minus this small length you have to subtract which is minus u theta sin theta is what you'll get okay because this length is same as this length is same as this length okay so you using simple geometry and simple trigonometries you can get this relation okay so now one important point i would like to say we define the complex potential function f of z this is the main story for this complete potential flows okay so what could be the complex potential function if you can identify the complex potential function your job is 100 percent done okay so and after that only simple math calculations will be there fine so f of z is called complex potential function complex potential function and this f of z is given by phi of x comma y plus i into psi of x comma y actually here okay this phi is called velocity potential of course velocity potential function this psi is called this psi is called stream function actually okay so psi is called the stream function okay so let's see if this is f of z one speciality about this function is it is analytic okay in last class when i'm talking uh, when i'm talking about complex calculus when i taught you complex calculus i have shown you what is an analytic function so this function is actually analytic function analytic function actually okay so let's see any flow can be understood using this complex potential function actually okay and if there is superposition of two flows we add the complex potentials of both the functions that's it okay and you know all the properties of complex numbers if two complex numbers are added how to multiply two complex numbers how to add two complex numbers how to subtract two complex numbers these simple fundamentals are known to you okay using that everything can be solved okay so just see this is the velocity potential function so if you have f of z is equal to phi plus i times of psi for example okay if I differentiate this partially with respect to x and z is equal to x plus i y, this is basically a point x comma y in the flow field. For example, let's say this is the flow field, then at any point in the flow x comma y, we define the coordinates x and y of course. Okay. So if you differentiate this partially with respect to x, with respect to x actually, okay, because many times in questions they ask you they'll give you phi and they'll ask you for st stream function or maybe they'll give you stream function they'll ask you for velocity potential function have you solved this kind of questions yes or no they'll give you phi phi is equal to half log x square plus y square to the base e then what is psi have you solved this kind of questions they'll ask you uh, you know many times this kind of questions might have come in your exams and you know in your when you're writing when you're trying pyqs these kind of questions might have uh, come many times okay so anyway let's see 
in this case differentiating with respect to x partially gives you f dash of z into dou z by dou x is equal to dou phi by dou x plus i into dou psi by dou x actually here okay now i want to tell you one important thing here when i told f of z is analytic okay so f of z is analytic so in last class i was telling this in maths class in complex numbers if f of z is analytic then definitely if and let's say f of z is equal to phi plus i times of psi maybe u and v so phi plus i psi so these should satisfy both phi and psi should satisfy should satisfy ci equations as or no because if, if i have given you already the function is analytic then if the function is already analytic they should satisfy the cauchy hellman equations okay so if these are cauchy hellman equations why it's analytic and all i'll uh, you know basically it's a detailed discussion again right, right now i'm not talking we have to take the derivatives of this function and we'll see velocities are existing at each and every point in the flow there is nothing like sudden jump there is no shocks in this potential flows so basically there is uh, a smooth velocity profiles which exist at each and every point okay so based on certain mathematical discussions we skip that so both phi and psi should satisfy the ci equations so let's see at this point do phi by do x is equal to do psi by do y and do phi by do y should be equal to minus do psi by do x actually so clearly you can understand one thing this guy is nothing but do phi by do x is nothing but x component of velocity your do phi by do y is nothing but y component of velocity means u is equal to do psi by do y steam function and v is equal to minus do psi by do x you might have seen these things also first steam functions okay so these are the steam functions now so let's see if you replace here this value is 1 anyhow because if you partially differentiate this with respect to x it gives you 1 f dash of z is equal to f dash of z is equal to do phi by do x is x component of velocity u plus i into do psi by do x do psi by do x is minus v so this is minus v so therefore at any point in the flow field the derivative of this potential function so if you know the complex potential function for a fluid then if you differentiate that function you will easily get what is x component of velocity and what is y component of velocity okay that's all simple clear if you know complex potential function if you somehow know the complex potential function then clearly you can understand what is x component of velocity and what is y component of velocity here okay now if you convert into polar coordinates let's see what happens if you convert into polar coordinates you will see this is in in polar in polar coordinates because this x and y everything is in cartesian but in polar if you do the same uh, thing again your f dash of z is equal to radial component of velocity minus i times of azimuthal component of velocity e power minus i theta this is what you get because if you this in place of this u and v if you substitute that relations u r cos theta minus u theta sin theta like i'll see u r is equal to sorry u is equal to u is equal to okay so u is equal to u r cos theta minus u theta sin theta v equal to u r sin theta plus u theta cos theta so if you put these two expressions in this relation in this relation u and v finally you can end up with e power minus i theta u r minus i times of u theta then in last class i told you one technique normally in case of analytic functions if u is given i told you the process that to calculate v means not this u and v let's say if phi you know phi and psi phi plus i psi is there if phi is given i told you the technique to calculate psi and if psi is given i also told you the technique to calculate phi of course correct so let's see in this case for example let's calculate this is actually the vertex flow okay but let's see if you know phi let us calculate what is psi if you calculate the answer would be tan inverse y by x actually tan inverse y by x of course okay so anyway let's see first of all how do we calculate if phi is equal to half log x square plus y square to the base e then your steam function what is your steam function okay if potential function is given then what is your steam function so let's see f of z is equal to phi plus i psi differentiating partially with respect to x gives you dou phi by dou x plus i into 
dou psi by dou y, uh, sorry, dou psi by dou x. So this can be written as dou phi by dou x minus i times of dou phi by dou y. Correct? Because you see, in Cauchy-Yaman conditions, dou phi by dou y is equal to minus dou psi by dou x. So dou psi by dou x can be written as minus dou phi by dou y. Okay? So that's why this minus sign comes here. So let's see. f dash of z, dou phi by dou x. If you differentiate this partially with respect to x, you'll see 1 by 2 into 1 by x square plus y square into differentiation of x square is 2x, okay, minus i into 2 by differentiation. Similarly, 2y by 2 into x square plus y square. This is what you will get. Yes or no? Please type in the chat box. If you differentiate this partially with respect to x and with respect to y, your f dash of z is basically this. Yes? Just doing the partial differentiation, okay? Previously, many of you might have done this question. It's very lengthy, okay? It almost comes like one, two pages. But right now, I'm just telling you something. Then I have taught you one technique applying Milner-Thomson method, which is one very powerful method actually. Milner-Thomson method. So in Milner-Thomson method, what you do? Replace x by z and y by z o actually. Okay. So if you replace x with z and y with z o, then this expression turns out to be, look what it happens, f dash of z is equal to, if you replace x with z and y with 0, if you put y equal to 0, y equal to 0 and z x is equal to z here, this complete imaginary term will go, yes or no? And y is equal to 0, so z by z square, you will be finally left with 1 by z, that's it, clear? So f dash of z is equal to 1 by z, that's all you need. So if you have this, therefore f dash of z is equal to f of uh, 1 by z actually, so if you multiply dz on both sides, okay? If you multiply dz and if you integrate, f of z is equal to log z to the base e plus constant, maybe some constant you have, okay? So let's see, in this case, if you know the expansion of log z, this is half log x square plus y square to the base e plus i times of tan inverse y by x. This is what you'll get. The advantage in this method is, after doing the complete solution, since phi is already given, this phi in the solution should match with this phi. Otherwise, your solution is wrong. So you can also check whether this phi is getting satisfied or not. If psi is given, maybe you'll convert this dou phi by dou x as dou psi by dou y. And similarly, same procedure you might have done. Then you might have checked whether psi is correct or not. Okay? You all know how this happens. Log z. See, I'll just show you, if some of you don't know. Z can be written as r into e power i theta in modulus form. In last class, I told you. Normally, any complex number x plus iy can be written as r into e power i theta. If you apply log on both sides, then ln r plus ln e power i theta. So this becomes ln r plus i theta. That's it. Okay. So theta is tan inverse y by x. And log r, ln root of x square plus y square. So half can come forward. And you can write x square plus y square here. That's it. Clear? So that's how we have the log expansion. So if you know this, then definitely using this, we can write this. So you see, hardly one, two, three steps. See, this applying Milner Thompson method will drastically, you know, reduce the complexity involved in mathematics. Okay? So that's why these complex numbers are very powerful technique to calculate steam functions from velocity potentials and velocity potentials from steam functions. Clear? To all of you? Yes or no? If this is understood, now I'll go for simple flows and then we'll see the superpositions of, uh, you know, rank and half body basically. Okay, then flow past a cylinder, flow past a rotating cylinder, we'll see all these things. Clear? So let's see now. Basic flows. I just want to give you some basic idea. So basic flows. All you need is, what is this complex potential function z, f of z, that's it. If you know this, you can do what all you want. You can just write as phi plus i psi, then you differentiate phi with respect to x, you get u, you get v, you can do any number of, uh, you know, things. But who gives you this f, to f of z? So we go in the reverse technique, basically. So let's say there's a flow which is taking place like this. For example, this flow is inclined at an angle alpha to x-axis. There is a flow which is inclined at an angle alpha to x-axis. Then clearly, you know, 
at any point in this let's say here also it is inclined at like this okay so at any point it is inclined let's say there is some flow which is taking place in this direction x and y for example then if this is the flow can anyone tell me what is the x component of velocity let's say this is u infinity for example okay if this is u infinity this is called for then u is equal to u infinity cos alpha and v is equal to u infinity sin alpha actually here okay so v is equal to u infinity sin alpha so you know if a flow is taking place in this format then u is u infinity cos alpha and v is u infinity sin alpha actually okay now let's see what we'll get f dash of z is equal to u minus iv in this case so u infinity cos alpha minus i times of u infinity sin alpha so u infinity if you take common e power minus i alpha is what you have as the f dash of z okay so this is the function for f dash of z then just you multiply dz on both sides and integrate f of z is equal to u infinity e power minus i alpha into z actually that's it okay so z can be written as x plus i y x plus i y of course okay now let's see if you expand this u infinity into e power my, uh, minus i alpha can be written as cos alpha into x cos alpha minus i sin alpha into x plus i y okay so if you simplify this u infinity into multiplication of complex numbers x cos alpha x cos alpha minus i into plus i this becomes minus i square which is plus 1 plus y sin alpha plus i times of u infinity into then y cos alpha minus x sin alpha minus x sin alpha you might have seen definitely for an inclined flow this is the velocity potential function and this is the steam function that's all correct have you seen this normally to get this you might have done a lot of calculations solving partial differential equations all these things but just to by simple integration you know once you write this as e power minus i alpha then multiplication of two complex numbers simple 11th class stuff so if you just do this you get a real part plus i into imaginary part a real part is the velocity potential and this imaginary part is the steam function actually clear okay is this clear to all of you so if you want lines of constant phi okay the lines of constant phi will be x cos alpha plus y sin alpha is equal to constant so y is equal y by x is equal to some minus tan alpha something like that and similarly here you know tan alpha is equal to y by x so y by x is equal to tan alpha see clearly if steam running is this then the slope is nothing but tan alpha because alpha is the angle with x axis so tan alpha is the slope that's all okay so now if alpha is equal to 0 if alpha is equal to 0 this is a flow along x axis so if you put alpha equal to 0 in this expressions you will get the steam function for steam functions and velocity potential functions for flow along a horizontal line okay like let's say if alpha is equal to 0 i would say if alpha is equal to 0 then flow parallel to x axis then what is phi in this case you see the velocity potential in this case is okay so if you put alpha is equal to 0 in this okay u infinity into when you put alpha is equal to 0 this is x and when you put alpha equal to 0 this is 0 then steam function psi is how much psi of x comma y if you put alpha equal to 0 this is 1 so u infinity into y that's it okay so those are the velocity and steam functions for this flow so if you know the points then things are very simple okay I would like to say one more thing here basic flows one is a uh, flow inclined here okay so inclined flow actually so this is inclined flow then let's see one more thing which is flow in a sector for example okay so flow in a sector and here guys I would like to tell you one thing in this case if you write f of z f of z is equal to phi plus i times of psi so u infinity is constant x plus i y this is z that's it okay so u infinity into z is the complex potential for this flow parallel to x axis clear so 
see one thing flow in a sector this f of z is given as u infinity into z to the power n of course okay so z to the power n and one important case here in actual things is n equal to minus half gives you flow across or flow past a sharp edge flow past a sharp edge sharp edge actually here okay so let's see in this case if you have f dash of z f dash of z for example okay so if you have f dash of z or f of z if you expand for example f of z is equal to u infinity z power n actually okay so this is u infinity of course so z power n if you see this as e power i theta power n okay so z is equal to some e power i theta you take cos theta plus i sin theta x plus i y you take so some e power i theta and what are the radius is there that you are uh, already compensating u into okay r power n also you write no issues okay u infinity r power n into cos n theta plus i sin n theta like in last class i have told you d mo is there e power i theta whole power n is nothing but e power i times of n theta actually so cos n theta plus i sin n theta so u infinity r power n cos n theta this is the stream function sorry complex uh, velocity potential function plus i into u infinity r power n sin n theta this is what you have okay so this is your stream function and this is potential function phi of r comma theta actually in this case okay so this is phi of r comma theta basically this part so this is velocity potential and this is the stream function actually now if you take the lines of constant stream function along psi is equal to constant if you take psi is equal to zero zero is also one of the constants so u infinity r power n into sin n theta is equal to zero for example okay so this ultimately gives you sin n theta has to be zero because at any point in the flow radius is not zero like for example if this is horizon then at some point here the radius is not zero between these two okay similarly u infinity is also not zero because if u infinity is zero there is no flow first of all okay so sin n theta has to be zero so you can understand theta is equal to zero or theta is equal to pi by n of course because n pi has to be uh, this has to be some multiple of uh, you know pi actually n theta is equal to pi so theta is equal to pi by n so for n is equal to 2 you will observe something for n is equal to like for example you take a uh, three no issue okay two three any values four five if you observe carefully this is the line theta is equal to zero in complex plane and this is the line theta is equal to pi by six in complex plane theta is equal to zero theta is equal to pi by three let's say 60 degrees okay so this is flow in 60 degrees so now if you plot the lines of constant side you will get this okay so this is basically the flow inside a sector clear okay and n equal to minus half is something like this if you put n equal to minus half you will see this is minus 2 pi okay so theta is equal to 0 and theta is equal to minus 2 pi then in that case this is theta equal to 0 and theta equal to minus 2 pi line will be again oriented along this okay so if you see this is a sharp edge sharp edge and the velocity profiles here will be Okay, so whenever there's a sharp edge, this is how the flow happens. Clear? So this is flow across a sharp edge, of course. And this happens when n is equal to minus half because this becomes theta equal to zero and theta equal to sorry. Theta equal to minus two pi. Okay. So these are the different things. Clear? Yes. Are you able to understand this? This is based on simple complex algebra, not even calculus. Okay. Forget about complex calculus based on simple complex algebra. So, how to find radius of rotating cylinder? I attend all your classes last year lecture. I, I'll tell you, okay. Uh, basically, how to find the radius? A value, na? that depends on circulation, no? A is equal to circulation by 4 pi u. You remember? We were talking. Anyway, I'll just show you. So, let's also talk about vertex flows and source and sinks, okay? So, source and sink or source sink, let's say, okay? So source and sink. So if you have a line, for example, let's say this marker, so that 
fluid comes out radially out in all the directions from this point okay so let's say we have fluid coming out radially out in all the directions okay so fluid comes out radially in all the directions so at a given radius r at a given radius r the radial velocity of the flow is basically u r let's say here the radial velocity is u r of course okay now when the flow is moving exactly radius so using vertex plus doublet plus uniform flow that's rotating cylinder yeah we'll see okay let me first finish this basic flows only source and sink and then vertex is what there then i'll start superposing the flows okay so just some uh, 15 20 minutes then we shall uh, reach that point okay so let's see if you have the radial component of velocity u r for example then we define something called strength of the source strength of the source which is normally denoted with m so strength of the source is denoted with m actually so here you see m is discharge coming out discharge per unit length of the source discharge per unit length of the source actually here okay so per one unit length of the <coughs> source what is the discharge actually here okay and this m can be written as like for example u r into 2 pi r because the radial velocity is u r and 2 pi r at any given radius if u r is the radial velocity then u r into 2 pi r gives the amount of discharge which is flowing radially okay by unit length this is what you have so let's see what we can understand so what is u r actually u r is equal to m by 2 pi r it depends on the strength of the so source actually okay so this is a source so u radial is equal to m divided by 2 pi r m is the strength of the source okay so let's see if this is u r what is your complex potential function f dash of z is equal to u r minus i times of u theta into e power minus i theta okay so this is what you have as the f dash of z okay now once you have these things u r is this can anyone tell me what is u theta value u theta the particle which is here moving just radially in this direction okay can anyone tell me what is u theta azimuthal component of velocity for those particles let's say if you have a source okay fluid is flowing out radially in all the directions is there any evolution of the particles is there any revolution of the particles actually type in the chat box is there any revolution of the particles about the axis let's say for example if source is like this at this axis then the particles are actually moving radially outward right yeah no evolution right so u theta is actually equal to zero in this case so if u theta is equal to zero then definitely if you put theta equal to u theta equal to zero so this u theta is of course zero in this case okay so f dash of z is equal to u r which is m by 2 pi r into e power minus i theta of course okay now applying milner thomson method to calculate equipotential potential lines and steam lines so applying milner thomson method so replace r by z and theta by zero okay so if you do this you will end up with f dash of z dz is equal to so you can see this d theta if you put zero here then this value is one okay so e power zero is one m by two pi z dz is what you get actually okay so integrate this you'll get f dash f of z is equal to m by two pi times integration of one by z is ln z so this is the complex potential at this point clear so for this source we have this f of z is equal to m by 2 pi ln z and if you see ln z the lines of constant pi are cycles okay so basically you see the lines of constant pi are cycles and streamlines are nothing but these lines passing through horizon because fluid actually flows in this so streamlines are actually like this okay so exactly at z equal to 0 this is not defined so we'll slightly leave at z is equal to 0 because we don't want streamlines to intersect of course so there's a singularity at this point so apart from that we'll see this is the generalized expression for the complex potential okay understood so this is how we have similarly 
if source is at a point a source is at a point z not then f of z a source of strength m of strength m is at z not then clearly you will see f of z is equal to m by 2 pi log z minus z not to the base e of course okay similarly if it's a sink there's a minus sign okay similarly for vertex if you have vertex of circulation m of circulation m then f of z is equal to minus i circulation by 2 pi times log z to the base e of course okay log z minus z naught to the base e is what we have z minus z naught okay and this gamma is basically the circulation which is equal to cyclic integral over the closed path velocity vector crossed dl bar okay so this is the circulation actually in this case okay so circulation is equal to vorticity into area of course so circulation is equal to vorticity because curl v vorticity times area this is what you have because if you apply stokes theorem this is over the area a d area a curl v curl velocity times d a bar which is n cap dot d a of course so vorticity into area gives the circulation in this case circulation okay now let's see superpositions superposition of flows so firstly a doublet simple case doublet or uh, doublet uh, you know we can just be because uh, source and same of uh, we'll see one thing here so before going to superposition of flows let's see one last uh, thing which is a doublet because doublet can be treated as a basic flow only why to go for superposition doublet so what is a doublet actually okay so doublet is basically the combination of source plus sink of same strength placed close to each other okay so source and sink of same strengths placed close to each other placed close to each other means basically if you have a source or sink maybe and a source so if the gap between these two spacing is epsilon so if this is epsilon your epsilon tends to zero in this case okay so epsilon will actually tend to zero so here if you see this f of z in this case is some constant divided by z that's it okay so we can just derive this it's not a big thing so normally you take the complex potential as for sink plus source z minus epsilon at sink and z plus epsilon at source after doing a bit of simple maths okay i'd like to show you whether okay so maybe i'll show you this just a minute i'll show you this okay so around that time i have taught some amount of potential flows okay so i'll show you this yeah here okay so i'll show you here so potential flows so if you see here in this case oh sorry this is the empty empty ppt but here yeah so this is superposition of flows already so one more slide before this yeah here yes so here you can see when we were talking about the <coughs> complex potential function for a doublet okay so one more slide i'll show you the last last one so let's see if you go for a doublet actually okay you'll see the maths i'll show you whatever the maths we have done so this is basically the flow past a cylinder and all i mean sorry sharp pitch and all so equipotential lines streamlines all these things then after yeah here it is 
So if you see, if you want to form a doublet, you have to place the sink and source basically very close to each other. Maybe sink and source or source and sink, you can see. So this is the potential function for the source and this is the potential function for the sink. You add those, then take this log properties, okay, use some binomial expansion, simplify certain things. You will end up finally, this complex potential function is actually C by Z in this case, okay. So if this is C by Z, then this C can be modified accordingly as per convenience, okay. So the epsilon value is very, very small and M is basically large actually in this case, okay. So now if you apply superpositions, superpositions, so first superposition, if you have a uniform flow plus source, okay. So you have uniform flow plus source like this. I, I would like to show you the diagrams first. So you can see uniform flow. This is uh, circulations, okay, which we have calculated actually here. So basically some circulation derivation I have done. Vorticity into area to show that, okay. Then you see this uniform flow with a source. When you do this uniform flow with a source, you will actually end up with a Vankin half body, which, uh, you know, I, I would just like to uh, show the sa salient points here. So uniform flow plus source. When you do the superposition of this, uh, in which batch I have taught this in every fluid mechanics batch I teach this okay when I'm teaching a detailed course okay so let's say this is u of z u of z is the same function for the la uh, horizontal flow okay I have shown you this okay so you see when we were talking about this flow parallel to x-axis okay so when the flow is parallel to x-axis depending on this alpha if uh, if you put alpha equal to zero you got f of z is equal to u infinity into z. So if you have this u infinity into z, of course u, u is the free stream velocity plus for this source, source is a torsion, so plus m by 2 pi ln z. If you just add the complex numbers, that's it, okay? So you see, I've just added, then after it's pure maths, I have got phi and psi functions. Then if you plot a particular psi function, then you'll get stagnation points here, okay? So stagnation point, the width. This question was actually in asked in XE 2021. So what is the total height BC actually, okay? So they've asked what is this BC? BC is of course M by 2U and this length is exactly double this BC. D is equal to times of BC, that's what you can see. Actually, if you uh, perform some limits and simple maths, if you do, you will understand. BC is equal to M by 2U. So this BC, whatever is here is M by 2U and this DF is also M by 2U, which you will get after a bit of uh, calculations again, okay? So this calculation gives you DE. This DE is actually M by U. This is called the half width of the uh, width of the ha again half body actually, okay? And normally this type of streamline can be analyzed by using submarines and all. So whenever the submarines is moving, you see this streamline shape is like a solid surface, okay? And no flow can uh, cut, uh, cut this streamline. So basically this acts like a solid boundary and the flow of submarines and all can be analyzed using this particular flows, okay? So let's see. Anyway, I'll give you the complex functions. So in exam, if needed, you can work out the things. So uniform flow plus source gives you a Vankin half body. Vankin half body actually. Okay. And f of z in this case is u infinity into z plus first source. It is m by 2 pi log z to the base e. That's it. Okay. Now let's see uniform flow plus doublet. Plus doublet. This gives you, this superposition will actually give you flow past a stationary cylinder. So if you have a cylinder, okay, of radius A, for example. So this is a cylinder of radius A. Normally for uniform flow, you have the potential as u infinity into z plus for doublet, you have constant divided by z. That constant you will modify as because constant can be written anything. So this u infinity into a square. This is what you actually write. Okay. So u infinity into a square where a is the radius of the circle. Okay. And normally if source and string are not placed close to together, if source and sink are not placed closely in this place, we get a Rankine oval, okay? So we'll get Rankine oval is what you'll get, okay? So this is basically the Rankine oval in this case. And these are the superpositions that you have normally. 
And actually, case in co in complex numbers, there is one powerful transformation, which is called the Zukowski transformation. Okay, which I'm not teaching right now. It's I think it's not even in syllabus because all over this years they have never asked that. So basically, that tells you if you have a simple uniform flow, we can actually estimate the flow across an A foil. Okay, practically analyzing A foil is not very simple. Okay, but using this superpositions and uh, you know basically using this uh, Zukowski transform, you can actually uh, get the solutions for the flow past a A foil. Actually, okay, so. And we see one last thing: flow past a rotating cylinder. Flow past a rotating cylinder. So this is superposition of uniform flow plus vertex plus doublet. First of all, plus doublet. Plus to impart rotation to the cylinder, we also have a vertex, sudden circulation. Okay, so f of z complex potential is u infinity z plus u infinity a square by z minus i times of circulation by 2 pi ln z. That's it. Okay, so you just add up the complex functions, then simplify the functions so that you will get some equipotential, uh, you know, basically phi and also psi actually in this case. Okay, now basically in this case, what we understand is we have certain important stuff to note. Even in this case of stationary cylinder, if you equate f dash of z is equal to zero, you'll get two values for z because this expression becomes quadratic. Okay, so try to understand. If you have f dash of z, then f dash of z gives you u infinity minus u infinity a square by z square. Okay, so that means if you equate f dash of z is equal to zero, means if you are looking for a stagnation point, this is a second degree equation, so you'll get two stagnation points. One is called the forward stagnation point. The forward stagnation point and one is the rear stagnation point is what you'll get. Okay, z is equal to plus or minus a is the locations of stagnation points. Like if you take f dash of z is equal to zero, then the z which satisfies this is called stagnation point. Because you know stagnation point is basically the point in the flow where velocity is zero. So if this is stagnation point, f dash of z is equal to u minus iv. If velocity magnitude of velocity has to be zero both u and v has to be zeros that means this derivative has to be zero so if you differentiate this function and equate to zero this is a second degree equation so we'll get two roots for z which is one and two so this is basically a uh, you know it, it, it has two stagnation points actually in this case clear one is called the forward stagnation point and one is called the rear stagnation point they just uh, appear just below this so minus a if this is horizon then z is equal to a that's all. Okay, so these are the two stagnation points. Okay, yeah, it's a uh, uh, thank you yourself, yourself. Sorry, yeah, you can just differentiate. Now, if you differentiate this, this is a qu quadratic in z because this derivative of one by z will be minus one by z square. So that's a you know quadratic. So just if you equate that to zero, then definitely you have two roots z equal to plus a and minus a. So one stagnation point just before the front of the cylinder and one at the rear. This is called the forward stagnation point and this is called the uh, rear stagnation point actually. Okay. And coming to this rotating cylinder case here, you'll see if you differentiate this, you'll have f dash of z is equal to u infinity minus u infinity a square by z square minus i times of circulation by 2 pi into 1 by z actually okay so this is what you have now this complex number has to be 0 means for example if you write z is equal to e power minus i theta and if you simplify you will un understand the stack which uh, analysis I will show you if needed yeah maybe here I have done it no then here so you see flow past a rotating cylinder maybe this uh, case I have shown so basically this is doublet you see this is flow past a uniform uh, superposition of uniform flow and doublet okay so flow past a stationary cylinder this is uniform flow and this is doublet so if you see this uz plus c by z this c can be written as u a square by z which i am telling you here actually okay so here i have told you u infinity a square by z actually so if you can you can just expand that using e power i theta e power minus i theta terms just use some complex multiplications and all then you will have the potential function and you also have the steam function so you will see if you look up look for the st stagnation points okay so you'll see along the streamline if i equal to constant r equal to a becomes one of the streamline so this practically one streamline will be cycle so if this streamline is a cycle then nothing can go inside the streamline so this acts as a solid boundary and this flow can be equal to analyzing the analyzing the flow as flow past a cylinder actually clear so r is equal to a and see 
stagnation points. If you do stagnation points, both your u, r, u theta has to be zeros. So you can see you have two values of that. Okay, one is here forward stagnation, and one is the area uh, stagnation. Basically, theta equal to zero and theta equal to pi. This is theta equal to zero and theta equal to pi actually here. Okay, and it some coefficient of pressure is also done. Basically, applying the Bernoulli's equation. But anyway, this you can uh, go through the document. Lift force generated will be zero. So this is flow positive rotating cylinder. Okay. So if this is the function, look the same function I have written here. Basically for the superposition of all the uh, functions. Now if you put z equal to e power theta and if you simplify, you will observe one thing. See, this is the phi and this is actually psi. Now when you are calculating the stationary points, look you have u r u theta of course. If you equate both of them to zero, the stagnation points here are related by this expression. You see, first getting stagnation points. This is the condition for stagnation point. Okay, so sine theta is equal to circulation by 4 pi u a, which I was talking previously. So there are two values of theta within the region 0 to 2 pi, which satisfies this. Okay, so therefore this values of stagnation points will be in such a way that if this is theta and this is theta, theta 1 and theta 2, this theta 1 and theta 2 will be in such a way that the sum is actually 180 degrees. Clear? Fine. So let's see. If you simplify this, then this is given by stagnation points, and we have also calculated expression for lift generation. Okay, so yeah, this. See, I'll tell you one thing. Normally, you'll have the stagnation points here, such that this angle theta one, this is theta one, and this is theta two. So theta one plus theta two is always 180. Okay, but as this rotation speed increases, 180 because sine theta is equal to circulation by 4 pi u infinity into a so a is this radius okay a is this radius now you will observe one interesting thing here in this case of cylinder as you increase the rotating speed okay as this circulation keeps increasing what happens this value approaches 1 because see this is actually a constant as I know u infinity is constant a is constant 4 pi is also constant the maximum value up to which sine theta can go is actually 1 so in this case, what happens is, if you if you keep on increasing the circulation, there comes a limit where the sine theta approaches one, and both these stagnation points meet actually here. So in that case, you have only one stagnation point. Okay. So basically, the number of stagnation points in case of rotating cylinder depends upon the circulation, rotation speed, and you know, circulation is equal to u theta into two pi r, of course. Okay. So two pi a, you can say two pi a, and u theta is nothing but r times or a times omega into 2 pi a so 2 pi a square omega is nothing but your circulation okay so if circulation of the vertex is given you can calculate what is angular velocity and also uh, radius okay so this is the expression for circulation 2 pi a square omega and what about lift generation because of the rotation you will also have certain lift generation which I have uh, derived here actually on the day so this is u theta of course okay so circulation should be equal to 4 pi u a sine theta should be 1 then both the stagnation points mix okay They'll, there's only one stagnation point so let's see uh, maybe here, yes, no, here. This is the case. Okay, so we have one more, one last thing. I'll show you maybe. Yeah, potential flows five, maybe here. Normally, I take five lectures, five two hours lectures to finish this topic. Ten hours, I'll take. Okay, so yeah, here we'll see flow past a rotating cylinder. So if you see flow past a rotating cylinder, so these are the streamlines, of course. So again, coefficient of pressure and all we have calculated, but calculating the lift force. Okay, so when you calculate the lift force. So P at a particular location acting on this small elemental area PS and if you integrate that you will see these integrations and all finally you will end up with the result okay. Of course this vertical force depends on the length of rotation this rho u sigma into L, L is the length of the cylinder okay. So lift force generated here in this case is rho u infinity circulation times L okay. So don't get confused between this L so this is lift generated is equal to rho u circulation times length of the cylinder is the lift which is generated in this case okay so all these are certain important points in terms of potential flows if you do some detailed analysis potential flows is one very powerful technique but the effort you have to keep is very less okay because there is no complicated mathematical understanding in this just all you should know is just adding two complex numbers multiplying two complex numbers and writing e power i theta as cos theta plus i sin theta these things if you know these things everything can be done and you can actually pick very beautiful uh, results from the potential flow analysis clear so let's solve one two questions before we close so i would like to solve some uh, questions maybe one two questions we have here so let's see so let's see here 
a source and sink of strength 4 meter square sec not 4 meter square per second and 8 meter square per second are located at minus 1 comma 0 and 1 comma 0 the stream function at the point p 1 comma 1 which is lying on the flow net of the resultant streamline is dash so let's see first of all so radius problem this now this is the radius you see not this yeah here you can see here this is what you have okay for unit length this is 2 pi a into 1 a yeah see for example if the slit is of unit length okay this is 1 clear and u theta is nothing but vorticity which is 2 times of omega okay so so u theta is equal to a into omega so if omega is given and circulation is given you can calculate what is a if cylinder radius is given then you can calculate omega okay because they have to give you strength of the vorticity or if they give you both you can calculate psi basically in this equation is what everything lies okay well same thing see here which i have told you so this is for the pressure variations and all but anyway if you just see here this is the condition basically okay u theta is equal to u because circulation is equal to 4 by ua this is the condition when we have a single stagnation point okay u theta should be equal to 2 times of free stream velocity clear so a into omega should be equal to u theta is a omega of course so u theta should be equal to 2 times of the free stream velocity to have a single stagnation point because this value fixes clear so anyway let's get into this calculations uh, yeah here so let's see a source of strength 4 meter square per second is located at minus 1 comma 0 so if you add the complex potential a source of strength 4 source of strength 4 so 4 by 2 pi ln z plus 1 okay so this is z minus of minus 1 so z plus 1 sink so minus 8 by 2 pi times ln z minus 1 actually here okay so this is the function the stream function at the point p 1 comma 1 is lying on the flow net of the resultant streamline is dash okay so let's see the stream function value which is resulting for the resulting streamline so first of all you have to simplify this and get it in terms of uh, some real function plus i into stream function okay so let's see if you take 4 pi 2 pi common you have ln z plus 1 minus ln z minus 1 whole square okay so this is what you can say so 4 by 2 pi into ln z plus 1 let ln z plus 1 divided by z plus 1 whole z minus 1 whole square okay so this is z plus 1 by z minus 1 whole square actually here okay so this is the value now we put z is equal to 1 in this okay so 1 comma 1 is basically here so if you put 1 comma 1 in this uh, case okay so this is like 1 plus let's simplify 4 by 2 pi times ln 1 plus i plus 1 so 2 plus i divided by so 2 plus ln 2 plus i divided by ln 2 plus i divided by when you put i plus 1 here i plus 1 minus 1 so minus 1 and plus 1 gets cancelled so i square is equal to minus 1 okay so this is minus 1 so log 2 plus i divided by minus 1 actually here that's what you have because 1 plus i minus 1 is what z equal to 1 plus i if you put because the point is 1 comma 1 so if you put z equal to 1 plus i 1 and minus 1 gets cancelled i square is equal to minus 1 so ln 2 plus i into minus 1 actually here okay so let's see log minus 1 so log of minus 1 you can get in complex numbers minus 1 can be written as e power i pi this can be written as 4 by 2 pi into ln 2 plus i minus ln minus 1 which is e power i pi okay so ln minus 1 minus 1 can be written as e power i pi of course correct because log mi minus 1 can be written as e power i pi cos pi is minus 1 plus i sin pi okay now this value is nothing but i times pi so this value becomes i times pi of course so calculating this value 4 by 2 pi into 4 by 2 pi into log of complex number half ln root 5 because root of a square plus b square plus i into tan inverse of 1 by 2 tan inverse of 1 by 2 so this quantity minus i times pi actually okay so this is the function okay because you know this log minus 1 can be written as this minus 1 can be written as e power i pi so i pi can be brought to the uh, you know forward actually so let's see if you segregate the real parts and imaginary parts in this psi therefore f of z 
the complex potential function is equal to 4 by 2 pi you know basically this 2 2 can cancel this so 1 by pi root ln ln root 5 by pi plus i times of i times of 4 by 2 pi into tan inverse 1 by 2 4 by 2 pi into tan inverse 1 by 2 so i think this 4 by 2 pi is also there for this so in fact we'll keep the 4 by 2 pi out for some time okay this bracket is also there for this now because 4 by 2 pi is there for completing so i into tan inverse of pi by 2 minus minus 4 by 2 pi into pi of course okay so into pi is also there so 4 by 2 pi into pi is what you have okay just some basic complex numbers you do so pi and pi gets cancelled so this is 2 anyhow so this is a 2 so therefore steam function is equal to at 1 comma 1 is given by 4 by 2 pi into tan inverse 0 0.5 minus 2 this is the steam function actually here okay so you calculate this you'll get the value of steam function constant in meter per second meter square per second i guess yeah meter square per second of course so meter square per second so just calculate this value so first of all put this value from degrees to radians okay because this complete thing is in radians 0 0.5 tan inverse 0 0.5 tan inverse okay so this is the value into 2 by pi because this can cancel two times actually so 2 by pi of course so into 2 divided by pi this value minus 2 of course okay so minus 2 minus 1.7048 minus 1.7048 meter square per second actually okay so the stream function value at 1 comma 1 is minus 1.7048 meter square per second this should be there somewhere okay so let's check whether we have this minus 1.7048 minus 1.7045 yeah basically you can see this is minus minus 1.7048 or 705 third decimal can change depending on uh, the rounding off but you can see it's a simple process actually once you define this function then at this point one comma one you try to calculate what is this function actually so you take the imaginary part that imaginary part is the stream function at that point okay that's all clear so minus 1.7058 actually is the stream function okay so this is how basically we even if you have superpositions okay so if you see these two stands are not same okay and they are placed at some different locations so this is maybe a vankin oval actually okay so like this you can keep solving questions okay so let's see if you want one more question we can see a uniform flow with a velocity of two meters per second is flowing over a source placed at horizon the stagnation point occurs at minus 0.398 then which of the following statements is true this is basically a vankin half body Vankin half body okay so this is basically a Vankin half body because it's superposition of uniform flow with source okay so if you add the complex potential again f of z is equal to u infinity into z so 2z plus m by 2 pi okay so strength of the source is not known to you so m by 2 pi this source is at origin so directly log z to the base e that's it okay so this is what we have now if you si simplify this question okay so if you solve this question let's see f dash of z is equal to 2 minus m by 2 pi z okay so this is m minus m by 2 pi uh, z of course okay uh, correct so this is what you have so you can see this value is equal to z is equal to minus m by if you have stagnation point first stagnation point first stagnation point f dash of z is equal to 0 i have told you this okay so f dash of z is equal to 0 so 2 minus m by 2 pi z is equal to 0 so this gives you your m or z basically m is equal to 4 pi z okay so 4 pi z where z is the stagnation point here in this case okay because by equating this 0 we got the value of z this z is the stagnation point okay and 4 pi into what is z z only has x coordinate okay so minus 0 0.398 minus 0 0.398 so this is actually the uh, uh, fine so plus this is plus no this is plus no yeah plus m by 2 by z no so this is minus okay so this becomes plus then this becomes minus so minus minus of minus yes so m is equal to some strength in meter square per second so see 4 pi into 0 0.398 how much it is 4 pi into 0 0.398 
It's a real number. Okay. Got it. If you see the stagnation point now, if it would there, if it would there, I would have rationalized. Okay. Then if I rationalize, and normally that special case is for Vanken body. In Vanken body, stagnation point is at real axis. Okay. That's why we got this. But Normally, if you take the case of rotating this rotating cylinders, then definitely would have got imaginary parts. Okay, if there is imaginary part, then the point is not on x-axis. That's it. Okay, we'll go to somewhere on the two D. Clear? Okay, fine. How to remove that i? Rationalization. Okay. See, you won't remove basically. Okay. In this case, they have asked source because you know that it's a real number. But normally, if you go for the case of uh, you know rotating cylinders and all, that i will automatically get elim eliminated. Okay. Yeah. So can you share slides? Yeah, I'll share. Okay. So I'll try to share this. No issue. Fine. Then wish you all the best. I think tomorrow we'll meet once again for. Uh, you know, meet Sandeep sir and uh, Shivam sir has this abhyas of XEFM. So we'll take this and yeah, I think that's fine. Fine. Okay, so thank you all. We'll meet again on tomorrow at 2 p.m. So to solve the questions. Thank you. Yeah, bye all of you.